All right, folks, this is episode 170 of Cowboy Shit. Thanks for sticking around with us this long. You made it past 169. You must be a real fan. My name's Ted Stoven. He's Dustin Edwards. We're in the backyard. We have our guest, special guest. You might recognize him. He's uh, sitting between us here, but we're going to introduce you to him in a little bit. Yeah, we're guest of the show today, Travis James, bullfighter, event producer, um, wiener dog, Aficionado. Aficionado, so he fits yeah. right in here. Caretaker. Wiener caretaker. We'll get to his story a little later. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're happy to have Travis on the show today. In the backyard. In, in the, the backyard, backyard studios. Beautiful, beautiful day. Yeah. Me and Ted just got back from a round of golf where Ted whipped my ass at men's night the other night. Yeah, it was bad. It was By a like lot. 13 it was bad. shots. Um, no, like I thought it was only 10. Okay. Felt like 13. It was a lot. It would have been 13 if I didn't cheat on a couple holes, but... <laughs> Uh, there's no cheating through an eight and a nine on the scorecard. <laughs> but today, me and Ted were, I had him by one. You had him by four on the front, yeah. didn't you? No, three. Three. Yeah. And then on 17, I gave you one back. We were tied on 18. And I just had to make about a three footer to beat Ted. No, it was like it. a seven footer. Felt like three. Yeah. And then uh, we tied. Tied. So well, they say it's just out. like kissing your sister. It's a tie. It is. We tied out today on the golf course, but uh, it was a good day. A couple of 89s. Yeah. It's Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day to all the moms yeah. out there. Yeah. It's a And it's May. And it's May. And it's finally warm in Alberta. Yep. Uh, in we had a May. busy weekend. In Brooks. Busy PBR weekend, but we were in Brooks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and uh, um, Santana? Carlos Santana. Is that what his name was? Yeah, Santana's his last name. He's a Brazilian. It was like a Gilmore. second. Gilmore. Gilmore Santana. Santana. So I made, to play some, I made sure to play some Santana when he was riding the bull. Yeah. Made a pretty solid ride in Brooks on Friday. Yeah, so he wins it. Corey Lars Memorial, though, in Brooks uh, in, at the uh, the CRE. Centennial Regional Arena. Yeah, as you are very familiar I with from your Drumheller Dragons Arena. I hate that PTSD arena. when I go into that arena uh, from all the ass whippings they laid on uh, laid on the Dragons when I was working with the team. That, how about the goal horn? That would yeah. be a highlight for me. So it's funny because I was telling the story in the dressing room before. I said, oh, I hated coming here because they had this... Goal horn. This goal horn, but it was it's a one of the guys who owns one of the boxes, the sweets. Yeah. And he has his own horn. And whether there was a good save or a big hit, he'd always blow this damn horn. And I said it was so annoying. And then the first time a guy made a bull ride, guy has that hoot, guy started honking his horn. horn. And I thought, I can't get escape this damn horn. Yeah. But but honestly, kudos to the guy with the horn. Yeah. Like he used it at his very effective times. Great. Yeah, the timing was impeccable. With the goal horn. It was, like, it was impressive. He'd be like, come on, make a little extra noise or something. Yeah. He'd just be... Wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah. <laughs> it but, was great. Uh, well, I was texting uh, Brian Cowie uh, during that. I was like, where the fuck is this horn coming from? Like, what? what is this? I was so confused because it wasn't like... Nobody knew it was happening. Nobody told me there was going to be a friggin' horn. I was a the... little worried because someone was making a heck of a ride and they were going to make the buzzer anyways, but he blew it right before the actual horn went off. And I'm yeah. like... Oh, oh shit! Man, hopefully, he doesn't blow this thing at six seconds. Thinking and somebody yeah. pulls her up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, nice crowd. Yeah, great crowd. Uh, Corb had a great show after uh, the arena. Kudos to the arena. They had never had a like dirt event in there like that before. Not uh, only that, but a dirt event and, and had to leave the ice in because yeah. of the bandits are still playing in playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. So credit Brooks for uh, hosting great, us. Beautiful great work night. by the crew. Yeah. 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 Good. And uh, and. Kyle, like like Kinky Larson, great great work by his crew. Uh, Buck Chrisman, shout out uh, Slim Wilson. The like the entire crew did a great yeah. job. Uh, and it was cool because Kinky Buckers had the bowl tonight, so yeah. Sage got to accept Grand the Funk? buckle. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It got was to awesome. Accept the buckle and uh, and Dustin, thanks to you for being there to call the show. Yeah, we're so happy to join you. Later in the show, you'll hear about us talking about uh, not ha- well, no taking on things and thinking you can do enough. And for me, one of those things is trying to call a show while I'm doing my music job. So called Dustin in to call the show in Brooks because I knew that I was probably going to fuck it up. So thanks for being there and doing that. Dustin. Happy to help, man. Making sure we fun, had a great show. Fun show is a good show. And, and you yeah. do a great job of that. Thank and you. And it's fun to work with our friends. So it's nice that I can bring you in, that I was able to do that and bring you in for the show. I, I was, I thought it was a lot of fun. So yeah, it was really there. good. I really enjoyed it. And uh, Denny had a great night. Yeah. Like, Halstead Brett, was on. Brett was on. BG. The whole, the whole crew. Yeah. It was awesome. Tanner Grillitz. Tanner Grillitz did a great job. Yeah, it was yeah. just really good. Kobe took some good pictures. Oh, uh, absolutely. Pyro Jeff. Pyro blew, he some, blew shit some shit up. He blew some shit up. It was just a good night of Borat. So good. And then they did it again last night in Cameron. In Cameron, so. yeah. 
Congratulations to Cody Coverchuk, one in Camrose. Yeah. That's Coy Robbins event that he puts on. Yeah. With uh, Jeff Turnquist. And they had they a great, a great show job. Too. Big crowd. Yeah. Meanwhile, Dustin was walking around the city for four or five hours. I went on a four or five hour stroll around Calgary. I'm yeah. really embracing myself in the city yeah. living here. And I did a whole bunch of mushrooms on the golf course. <laughs> 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 I had a and great you had time. three birdies. You should have got on the shrooms the today. Nine. You only had one birdie today. Oh, I, no, I didn't have any birdies. I missed them. You all. needed more shrooms. Needed more shrooms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. So a great, great weekend. Great weekend. Yeah, and we got a great Beautiful show coming weather. up. The Oilers, grass is very hot. I need to friggin' mow the grass. Oilers are up two one. Hey, no, they're uh, it's one one. Or they're gonna be up two one after the show comes. Hopefully, out. hopefully. Yeah, Touch maybe wood. three one because it's Tuesday. They got no game. Yeah, Sunday, another Tuesday. game Tuesday. Anyways, hopefully the Oilers don't suck. Otherwise, maybe there won't be a show. Because we'll Ted's see. wearing an Oilers hat as we speak. Wearing an Oilers hat right now. Tough. Anyways, Anything hopefully else they do good. That's all I got. Oh, hey, you know what else I got? What else? This is new music by Dusty Golden. Make sure to find him on all wherever you get your music. Dusty Golden. Right after this, on the way to the interview. All right, welcome to episode 170 of Cowboy Shit. We're live in the 4620 Backyard Patio Studios. The sun is shining on a beautiful Mother's Day today. Dustin Edwards, Ted Stoven, and we're joined with a really special guest today. He's packing his wiener with them here beside us. <laughs> and let's go into this introduction. He's a former freestyle bullfighting champion, a former... WRA barrel racing finalist, the founder of Rank Mini Pony, the founder of the Element Zone in Edson, Alberta, uh, bull rider, steer rider, did every event, ranch bronc rider, but uh, he's got one heck of a story. He's an entrepreneur. Hope I didn't miss anything. Welcome to the podcast, Mr. Travis James. Jesus, you guys might have to like check my tire pressure. They might blow up on the way home. You pumped them up so much. <laughs> Did I miss anything? <laughs> no, that's about it. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been a. I feel like Travis has been one of those guys, Ted. That's been a been a long time coming to be be on here. Yeah, and then he just texted me the other day. He's like, "Hey, you got a spot on the podcast coming up?" And I'm like, "Yeah, sure, we can make that happen." Yeah, Let's yeah. Like, can we like too. can we talk on this podcast in like three hours, kind of thing? That's how it was. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, but it's good to have you on, uh, Travis. You uh, you've you've been an entrepreneur the last couple of years, but uh, a guy who grew up in rodeo and been around rodeo, and and you've had some some ups and some downs, and uh, you know, I've been a friend of yours for a while, but you've got a very interesting story to say the least like that's probably really underselling it if if anybody didn't know you before this podcast we're, we're going to give everybody a, a bit of a look behind the curtain here i'm uh, in the middle of writing a book i'm like just about done so if i miss anything or whatever we can <laughs> you know catch a little bit of book pre-sales on that maybe yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah so uh i guess we might as well go back and learn a little bit about about travis uh, james growing up Obviously, this is cowboy shit. So, let's talk a little bit about your uh, your life growing up in in rodeo. Because I, I I jokingly said barrel racer, but uh, you were a heck of a pee wee barrel you racing. Weren't, star. You weren't joking because it's true. Because you made the you made the water Rose finals in the pee wees and juniors or just pee wees. Ah, uh, so my brother was the better barrel racer. <laughs> um, it was kind of funny. So he used to we used to both ride the same horse and we would alternate on weekends. And no matter which horse we rode he always seemed to do better than I did. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, I didn't make it in the peewees, um, but I was season leader once, I think, maybe twice in the junior bell racing. Oh, did you get a trophy saddle or anything back then? Or Nope, just a little watch oh, and yeah. uh, and a buckle that sits on the trophy case. Coveted. So you were a barrel racer, but then you rode, you rode steers and junior bulls as well, right? Yeah, well, guys kept picking on me and stuff, so I was like, well, I'm not the best barrel racer, so I should probably steer ride or something cool, but... What was the horse that uh, took you to all those season leaders? Uh, Dandy, a little bay mare. Nice. Nice. So, so rodeo was part of your family growing up then, essentially. Um, did you guys kind of grow up always riding horses and, and kind of rodeoing in the North Country? Is that kind of where it all started? Yeah, we gym canned lots when we were kids, but like looking back through my pictures, like I found a picture... I was three days old. They were like holding my head up, sitting on the back of a horse. So you, you were like, bo you were born into it. Yeah, I was joking. I was, I was probably born on top of a horse. 
<laughs> or conceived on the top of a horse. <laughs> I don't want to think say. about that part. Yeah, fair. Would you guys have been, uh, you guys would have, Ted, you'd have been quite a bit older, but would you have been rodeoing in the North Country? Similar. Similar? You, what age are you, again, Travis? I'm 31. Yeah, I'm only 34. So you guys would have been... Similar. Ted, you'd have been riding junior bulls and stuff oh, when steer Travis was steer riding. Yeah, st- I'm sure. Same time, yeah. I'm sure it was. Because you would have spent a lot of time up in those all those North Wild Rose. Wild and Rose and Lakeland. Yeah, because yeah, I think you grew up Cara. in like San Gudo, didn't you? Or Drayton Valley. Yeah, not too far away. Yeah. I was thinking, uh, what would it have been? Would Travis Rie and like your family put on a, have put on like a steer riding school? Yeah, we put on a steer riding school. and a, Yeah. Yeah, I think a couple of steer riding schools, actually. I remember coming to one, and I think that there was coffee and Bailey's in, in like, a cup that your mom gave all of us. Oh, yeah. And like, I was, even, like, 15, like she, and there was She drank so much, that coffee one. Coffee and Bailey's. Uh, that one school that she even got on one at the end of it. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Right That's on. That's wild. And your brother was two years younger than you. Yeah. And he rode Steers Junior Bull Road as well, right? We're talking yep. Jesse. Jesse. Yep. Jesse James. Yeah, he uh, wasn't a very good steer rider. I think there's only one picture of him not getting um, slammed on his head. But uh, he was a heck of a barrel racer. And your and your mom barrel raced and did all the various rodeo events as well, right? Like throughout the course of her career? Yeah, yeah. And then a lot of people actually don't know this, but my grandma actually clowned a few events back in the day. Really? Yeah. What was her name? Uh, Shirley Janish. Really? That would have been a long time ago, like probably way before I was even thought of. Like only like 20 years into Ricky Tiki's career? <laughs> uh, I don't know, maybe only like. Ten. <laughs> like oh, really? A long time ago. Where would she have clowned? Probably nope. just them bush rodeos around us. Really? I think. I, like High Ridge or something, or yeah, what? Yeah, I'm not really sure to be honest. I just seen some pictures one day. Really? Did you have anyone when you were up in those northern rodeos that kind of took you under your wing, or you kind of idolized when you were growing up up there? Like that's there's a lot of good cowboys that come from the North Country. Like it's a it's a big cowboy area up there. So we did. Uh, I remember this actually. It's funny now. Um, circling back, but I, um, Miles Pennington was actually one of the guys that I really looked up to. Boner Lake Miles. Hey, Milt, shout out. Yeah. yeah. What Mile. about Miles? Did you, did um, you just, I'm not too sure. Like he was, that was the years he was like season leader in the bull riding and stuff. He was and the nicest guy ever too. Yeah. Like, I think he was one of the only is. guys that helped me on. Like when we were, when Real, we were first sorry. getting on. So right. Like, oh, here's on. this barrel racer kid. We got to, yeah. someone's got to pull I don't rope. remember. I don't remember you riding though. Like I don't remember That's you because I wasn't very good for the longest time. Oh, okay. Okay. Jordan Hansen was a horrible steer rider, too. Yeah, uh, the, the one WRA. year is funny. So I think there was 26 people that made money that one year, and I made $8.75, I think. <laughs> I, like, six-way split, sixth place at Manning. But Jordan Hansen was one notch behind me on the list of people that made money that year. Really? <laughs> yeah, Gee. I think he only no made, way. like, seven or six bucks that year. Really? Funny. Yeah. He was awful, though. He'll tell you that. He was terrible. It's funny uh, th- when you look at all those uh, old like WRA programs, and what was the other one up there? The North NRA North? NRA. The, yeah, these that have the finals and Grand Prix, right? That was yeah, a little NRA. bit before my time, but we like we not did a far lot of, though because I rode at a couple NRA. Rodeos. Yeah, we did a lot of WRA and LRA, and yeah. like the kids that I rode with, like are now like the Zeke Thurston's and those type of those are yeah the people we grew up with. Well, I can remember like Brock Radford being at the WRA finals and Jordan and. The West, like there were some really good hands up there. My that. years, it was Ty Patton. It oh, was like yeah. Patty and myself, and I think Wacy Finkbeiner came along. Jordan Ness and I rode in the Wild Rose stuff at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you have another cousin? No. Who was the other James that I'd be thinking about though? I s- I forget now. So b- before Maybe we get I'm thinking somewhere, and else. before we get into the uh, um, unfortunate incident with your brother, is. There's still a award, isn't it for? Isn't there a Jesse James Award in the Wild Rose? Wasn't there oh, an award? Oh, I'm not too sure. Am I, I getting confused? I thought there used to be like a. Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there is. Okay, maybe I screwed that up. I thought there was an award for like a high marked ride for a memorial. It's okay, for we can somebody. just make Sean edit that part out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Sean. That's gonna be edit. No, it might be the Dusty Wilkinson you're thinking about at the Wild Rose or at the LRA, LRA finals. There was one. There was one in they the. They did one for my mom, kind of like. Well, there was one in the Wild Rose final for the highest steer ride of the finals, and I thought it was the Jesse James Memorial. I forget. Yeah, Anyways, yeah. we got that part. Eight right. minutes in. Sorry, Sean. Eight minutes in. <laughs> Screw it up. I'm sure. Let's there just start be. start another question. I gotta Google and roll that. On. For my own thinking. Um, okay. Where the hell were we? And now I got off track. Okay, <laughs> so we, we talked about go. your... Okay, so we talked about um, your rodeo career, younger, 
barrel racing, steer riding, and then you transition into fighting bulls. Yeah, well, there's the a little thing, bit right? of middle in there. Um, <laughs> what was in the middle? It's not the entire story, What Dustin? was in the middle? I rode uh, steers for a couple of years, and then from steer riding, transitioned into junior bull riding, and then at 18, kind of switched over to fighting bulls, so... And what was the reason? What got you into fighting bulls? Because you had a long, you had a you know a pretty long tenure fighting bulls. Yeah, I fought bulls for thirteen years total. I just retired in September. Um, but honestly, so I like I don't know how far you want to circle back, but once so my brother passed away in two thousand six, and it was about when he passed away that I was kind of trying to like get out from his shadow. And so I was kind of trying to do all sorts of things. That's when I kind of was steer riding harder. And uh, I even actually rode his horse for a couple of years there. And I was um, season leader in the junior barrel race in one year at the Wild Rose riding his horse. So, yeah, there's that. But uh, kind of just wanted to pave my own way, I guess, would be the best way to put that. And bullfighting was kind of that avenue for you. Yeah, because I was a horrible bull rider. <laughs> I... I don't yeah. remember you riding bulls either, but I might have been doing like I might have been away somewhere by then. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Just probably because I wasn't that good, <laughs> you know. So and then, um, yeah, I started fighting bulls out of practice, and I just wasn't really in the right headspace to ride. And I can't remember who it was didn't show up to fight bulls, and I was like, oh, it can't be that hard. I did it, got really lucky, made a really rank save, and then I'm like, huh, if I actually tried to do this, I might be okay at it. So, yeah, I went to a bunch of schools and then just kind of fought bulls for a while. What uh, what schools did you go to? Like, where did you, where was it that you kind of honed your craft at the start? I went to a lot of Scott Byrne and Monty Phillips schools. Um, I went to one Aaron Ferguson school. And uh, early on, I went down to a Rob Smets and a Miles Hare bullfighting school down in Texas. Yeah, so you really went in on the kind of the learning side of it. Because there's, there's some guys that go to like one or two schools and then just kind of do it. But that you kind of focused on wanting to learn from good guys, eh? Yeah, because I could see a lot of natural talent, but honestly, I was pretty clumsy. Like, the first school I went to, I think my girlfriend even had to tie my shoes. Like, I was just really uncoordinated, but I was like, well, if I keep trying, like, I might get better eventually, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> was uh, was Sean Morton an inspiration on your bullfighting career, being such a great from up in that country? Uh, not Sean so much. <laughs> I actually didn't know Sean was a bullfighter until a couple years later. Oh, really? Yeah. He even has a buckle from the 06 Wild Rose Finals. Yeah. It's but, the cleanest uh, buckle ever. Like, I don't know how he keeps it so shiny. It's it was impressive. like a long time in my, in my bullfighting career when I found out Sean was actually a bullfighter. Really? Yeah, when I went to go get my Bragg knee braces, I seen his brother's picture up there at the... Muley. Yeah, Muley. Yeah. Kelly. Yeah. And then how'd you, but how'd you ever figure out Sean was a bullfighter? When did he confess? I think he just told me. Sean yeah. was, I have to admit, Sean was always impressed with you as a bullfighter. He always thought you were uh, the real deal. Just tough, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I wasn't very good for the first couple of years. It just kept getting hooked. Man, and bullfighting has to be the most shittiest thing to be able to get jobs. Because they're just like, like not trying to shit on anybody here, but like there are so many people with names and with like their their life is in the industry and it's about who who they are more than the skill and you know in my opinion i would say it sometimes like and i don't know the bullfighting side enough but like if you are friends with the right people it's a lot easier well i was actually telling jobs. somebody this the other day and like i don't want to get into the politics too much of it um but coming from a non uh rodeo family essentially coming from like a barrel like, racing yeah, background, barrel racing background. <laughs> <laughs> um barrel racing lineage <laughs> i uh I had to work four times as hard as some of those guys to get about half the work that they got. And so, yeah. I always actually kind of joke with my barrel racing background now that uh, people always complain about barrel racers being, you know, complaining about bad ground. And I'm like, bullfighters are actually way worse. And I'm, you know, being from both backgrounds, I complain the most out of everybody about bad ground. <laughs> well, I have to admit, like, I, I think of all the shows that we work together over the years, whether it be... BRCs or amateur or even in the pro rodeos, you um, you were never scared to get in the tough spots. And in fact, you probably put yourself, you probably be the first guy, you know, if you were working with anybody to, to jump in and, and help out. But you're you're kind of fearless in that respect. Well, and actually speaking about those 
rodeos and stuff like that's how much harder i had to work as a bullfighter like i had to put my own events on so that that's i had true. somewhere to go <laughs> like that's why we did those so travis could have a <laughs> could fight a bull yeah i just yeah. want to fight bulls so we'll just put a whole rodeo on why not it's not that hard yeah <laughs> so i guess now we can we can kind of work backwards because we you know we talked about you being a bullfighter and we can get some more into that but um then you you dived into becoming a contractor for miniature ponies and miniature bronc riding with the company that became rank mini pony how did that all start because that's uh that's another interesting turn <laughs> turn, turn in your career so i wanted to fight bulls so bad that i wanted to make sure i was available in the summer to fight bulls well if anybody's ever seen a bull fight in check they're not that good so i was like okay how can i make money at rodeos to sustain you know being available throughout the summer otherwise i live in an oil field town i'm gonna have to get a job and then if i'm working in the patch nobody's gonna hire me as a bullfighter so i'm just like i seen a void in the it started in the wild pony racing i'm like well i could like triple my paycheck going to some of these events i can afford to rodeo then because basically like is it mel laws was like the only real Mini yeah, I seen right? I seen how much he was charging a committee, and I'm just like, woof, can't be that hard to buy a bunch of ponies and you know drag them along with me. But like the way my brain is wired, it's tricky because a couple ponies turned into at one point in time there was 97 at the house. Like you had 97 <laughs> ponies, we had oh seven God. studs, man. It was wild. I just if I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna dive all in. You went all in on that, yeah. Rank mini ponies. So because it started out with just mini, like. Uh, wild horse racing ponies right that was the first yeah that's how thing. it started and then like a year or two in that was kind of a bust so <laughs> <laughs> the mini bear you brought him to big valley i remember we hired you for yeah. big valley you came and fought the rodeo and brought the mini ponies why was it a why was it a bust oh uh, just because no it was there too, wasn't too seasonal there wasn't enough money in it so i'm like okay well now i gotta figure out how to make more money yet and uh about that same time frame the mini bareback riding thing took right off. And at that point, I already had 30 ponies. So you so were just bucking the ponies you had bought for the wild horse races. Yeah, like basically, races. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I called Shay, and I'm just like, let's just dummy buck a bunch and see if I even have anything that's going to buck. That was Shay Marks? Yeah. yeah. So where did you buck your first mini pony? We uh, rented the arena in Edson on Boxing Day, and we just dummy bucked like 30 head of ponies. It was pretty western. <laughs> Who was getting on them? We just dummy bucked him with like a little. Oh, you like, said dummy bucked. Yeah. So then this kind of. I mean, Shay got on one that day. Let's be real. Oh, Shay Marks. Yeah. Oh, dude. he'd be oh, about how the how same size go? as some of those little kids that were. Getting uh, on that pony thing. did not make the cut. It was. Oh, it didn't buck. It might have been like a like one of those jumping ponies. Like it was okay. moving, and okay. he just ran around the arena like mock chicken. And Shay was actually scared to get off. It was moving so fast. <laughs> but you know I, where I feel I can really relate to here on this conversation is that. Um, my, me, myself, I was also, uh, in on the contracting side of the mini ponies because me and Sean Morton, uh, were the proud owners of one of the mini ponies that was in the bucking string. Yeah. Old sleepy dancer. I thought it was Gord Downey. Well, and you're, was it you? I think it was you that helped me name sleepy dancer that year. I think so. But we had Gord Downey, <laughs> the mini pony that we bought in, what did we, we bought in an auction? I think so. The first year we did the bull ride and i think there, we there did like a silent of, auction or something one of the items raise, was uh naming rights on a mini naming buck and rights pony. on a mini buck and pony so me and sean went halfers on it i think I ted think was, was gonna story. go in on it too and we called it Gord, Gord Downey had just passed away from the tragically hip the lead singer yeah i think sean was or ted was gonna go in it because you guys are gonna name it after your guys's initials but std didn't really look that's like what a, it was yeah really make a good pony bucking name yeah std <laughs> So we went with Gord Downey, and Gord Downey became really the prize of the of the, of the bucking string, I thought. Yeah, other than it was a little confusing. But, I mean, we're kind of in that time frame we when were, you kick the colt out and you're named a pony Gord Downey. Like. Well, we were really disappointed because I think the one year you had the rank mini pony Canadian Cup, and there was a prize. There was a, wasn't there a bronc halter for the top, or there was a prize for the top bucking horse that week? Yeah, I'm probably one of the only guys that, you know, put up mini bronc riding finals on with a horse of the event and i was the only <laughs> contractor <laughs> <laughs> but we were really holding out that our gord downey was gonna was gonna be the winner of that be the winner 
Yeah. So well, you could have so put a sweet halter on your wall. Oh yeah. Destiny. So I still think there could. We should talk about that. I think me and Sean deserve need a re uh, a reevaluation of the judge sheets. Yeah. Yeah. We could go back. So, so you go from the mini pony wild pony racing to mini bronc riding and the mini bronc riding thing did kind of take off for you because you were really starting to go to a lot of events with the mini broncs yeah and like the worst the worst part about it was so the mini bronc riding thing took off before facebook got real lame with their algorithms and stuff so like we could put out videos and we could reach three hundred thousand views and what happened was so like the big goal was to fight bulls. That was always number one option. But the mini bronc riding thing overtook my bullfighting. And then for a while there, people didn't even remember I fought bulls. And I was already like three, four, five years into my career. So that's when, like, when I was fighting bulls, that's why I was wearing those really shiny socks. And, like, I wore a helmet and, like, fancy shirts and stuff. I'm like, hey, guys, I'm still here, by the way. Look like a total idiot, but... I had to do something to try and, you know, make people remember that I was still a bullfighter first. Do you think, and, and you did it out of necessity to make money and survive in the world that is Western events, which is tough. Um, do you think that looking back, like doing the mini Bronx and the mini ponies, do you think, do you think it impacted getting work because you think people took you less seriously? Like, it's like, oh, here's the, here's the guy with the little miniature horse trailer hauling all these mini ponies oh, around? Oh, 100%. It, but the worst part about it was it it took away, like, I personally feel I never fought a lot of finals because of it, but I don't regret it at all. So it's kind of like a little give and take. I just, like you said, I think people didn't take me serious because they thought the pony bucking was always my number one priority, which in fact was to try and supplement some income so that I could actually afford to fight bulls because the wages just weren't there. Yeah. So how many years did you run the mini bucking ponies? Because you ran a, like a mini bucking finals and put on some of your own events. How many years did that span go? And by the way, I was the voice of the second rank mini pony finals. Um, Very I, proud of that, by the way. I bucked ponies for seven, maybe eight years, give okay. or take. Okay. And and now looking back, some of the kids that came through, I, I mean, I, I've, I know a lot of them myself have gone on to good rodeo careers, but... Who are some of those kids that uh, started on mini bucking ponies with you and now are are, are true rodeo athletes? Uh, so there's three names uh, for sure. Um, but I think my favorite story is Chase Siemens. So his brother come to one of my schools and was going to try it, got on like maybe three head, and it wasn't for him. So they were going to pack up their stuff and go home. And Chase was like, Dad, we're already here. Can I try it? And so he tried it. And then blossomed into last year he won the novice bareback ride at the CFR, and you know like I think that's a pretty cool story because he wasn't even gonna he wasn't even the one that signed up to enter the school. Well, that's cool. Yeah. That's and then really like cool. another kid would be like Spur Cottingham, a uh, non rodeo family, and his kid won or he won like the high school finals. And then like Denver Leach is another kid. Um, granted, he started up north at their deals. But he kind of went through the pony string, and he won the BRC finals last year in the bull riding. Yeah, and he was at the CFR, too, in the novice, too, I think, wasn't he? Like, and I'm yeah. sure if a guy dove into it more, you'd find more. But those are three kids that I think of. That's pretty neat. And, like, Chase is doing really good work, Yeah. too. Yeah, like, him, he like, holds the some... record at the Dawson Pro Rodeo. He was, like, 85 yeah. the year I did it. Yeah, in the novice. In the novice bareback ride. He has yeah. more points than they were in the open. Yeah, That's it was cool. impressive. That was, yeah. Wasn't that just last year? Yeah, something like that. Like yeah, you last had, year or the year before. You yeah. had a lot of kids come through through the through the ranks of the rank mini pony and and kind of start their career. And then there was the one kid that rode remember that video went viral of that kid that rode at your Edson event when it was inside. Um Tanner Miller. Tanner Miller, yeah. Yeah, what was the story that that video was like viral, wasn't it? Like he made like a rank mini bronc yeah, ride. If if you know anything about bucking horses though, like that pony was a lot more front end than back end, but um, just kind of bucked across the arena and I want to say it was like, I think it went to like 5 million views or something ridiculous like that. Yeah. I think, I think I was judging on the microphone. I think we marked him like 87 or something, but it was, yeah. a, it was a rank ride, but I remember that video had went like crazy. Yeah. And, and like, cause so that we put a PBR on that year and we were trying to send it in for the PBR to like share it. But they're like, man, this has nothing to do with bull riding. <laughs> we're like, but this is a rank video. And they're like, yeah, but... I'm like okay, fair. Yeah, 
And then he went on to, wasn't he, didn't he become like the world champion mini bronc rider? Yeah, yeah, he was, I think he was one of the first world champions in the saddle bronc ride in the mini bareback ride, or in the mini saddle bronc ride, I guess. Did he, does he still, did that kid ever keep rodeoing? I think he's bull riding now. I think he's junior bull riding. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, I, I still remember that. And that was a fun story. So this, this is kind of a little off topic, but that ride was so ranked that I was just, I turned a picture into a bunch of t-shirts and then I was like, oh, I'm going to make a bunch of money selling these T-shirts of his picture to all these kids. Not thinking that nobody wants to buy a picture of somebody else's kid <laughs> on these T-shirts. And then I went and I got like a $3 discount if I bought a bunch of white T-shirts. And nobody wants to buy white T-shirts for their How kids. How many did you buy? I bought like 800 Oh my like, God! Really? Like a lot. Oh my goodness! So where That's are these shirts now? Yeah, where are you I got still a couple, have some? Like a probably your <laughs> size and your size and my yeah. size. Like, oh boy, they're all just in a box. We try and give them out at my events just because I can't even sell them for five bucks now. Yeah. That's hilarious. Did you ever sell any? I sold a couple. Like two? Uh, maybe <laughs> out seven. Of, out of eight hundred. <laughs> to seven. the to, to his, the, his, his to grandparents the Millers only. Yeah. yeah. To his grandparents. Yeah. To his mom. Oh dear. Yeah, it was. Uh, some some of my business choices in life are not the best, but. Yeah, and that's a rodeo family. Like his. His family's Miller Rodeo. I used that's what I started announcing for. Oh, yeah. They were the, the first contractor I worked for in rodeo was Miller's up and I did their rodeo in Fairview. Oh really? Yeah. One of the one of the craziest Miller rodeos Kyle I ever Miller's remember going dad, to. Right? Yeah. Kyle. Kyle picks up. Ford Cinnaboyn was one of the craziest ones. Oh yeah, that was to. a Miller rodeo. It was nuts. Because uh what's the grandpa Doug? Doug was is his grandpa and had hmm. Miller Rodeo and they were quite the crew. Yeah. And Scott. Yeah, it was yep. a fun crew. I like the Millers. Um, Loved working for them. I I forgot about. I think Brett started with them too. Brett yeah, Denver. I think you, I think he started there, the, some of Fort those places. Fort yeah. Assiniboine, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we used to go to White Court and Fairview. Oh and yeah, all those Valley yeah. View, Valley View. Yeah. Um. Okay. I re- this reminded me of a picture, the Ottawa one where you get the horn in your face and you're getting mucked out on the freestyle side of things. Do you remember that picture that Kobe took? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he took a bunch of good pictures of me fighting <laughs> bulls. Lots of hook-ins, lots of cool ones. And actually, one of the one of the coolest pictures he took is me jumping. I think it was that same bull or the other. There was two bull fights that year. Yeah. And, like, I'm, like, three feet clearing this bull. Yeah. And I everybody looks at it. They're like, you can jump that high? I was like, I was just that scared. That's <laughs> <laughs> I just jumped that high. Yeah. Holy. So I just forget that one. But like, what was going through your head, though? Because I think that bull's horn is like in your fucking cheek. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm it was gnarly. Not in a good shot sp- spot there, oh, but dear. that's that's bullfighting. Because you went out on that East Tour, right? Yeah. Fighting bulls out there? Yeah, they had two bullfights out there. Was it London and, uh, London Ottawa? and Ottawa? Yep. Yeah. And then you fought in that, what is it, XBF? Yep. And you in got a bullfight from there? Yeah, I spent um, I spent five weeks out there that year. Um, like out east. Yeah, at Dom's place in Quebec. Yeah, actually, if I, I mean, I'm nowhere close to getting married right now. But if I was to get married, Dom would be in my wedding party. That's how close we are. You guys were. I'm closer. Close. To, I'm closer to Dom than I am you. <laughs> Just so I'm you know. F- I'm so offended. Just offended. But you guys spent a lot of time. Yeah. In that period out there, and right? it was like, it was in a a pretty important part in time in my life too, like. Um, one of those early, I think I went to one or one or two bullfights out there, and um, kind of in the middle. That's the summer my mom passed away, so it it worked. It was like a good retreat to be out there. Not a lot of people spoke English, so I could kind of like hide and you know and essentially grieve on that side of it. Yeah, that's uh, maybe that's where our transition into. You know, we've kind of touched on the bullfighting career, and there's lots more stuff we can go circle back to on the freestyle and 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 putting on your events and stuff. But um, maybe we'll kind of circle way back because we were talking off off uh, the air before we started about kind of you've had a. I said it in your intro, you've had some ups and you've had some downs. But I mean, your your road has been is wild. It's a wild story. But maybe we'll go back to your brother because we talked about him uh, at the start of the show. And of course, he had a, a tragic accident and, and and passed away when you guys were younger. So uh, maybe we kind of just touch on that a little bit and, and the story of your brother, because yeah. Um, and and so I can kind of start with like the Cliff Notes version if you want. But uh, in 2006, my brother passed away in a car accident, um, 11 years old. And then fast forward 10 years later, 
Uh, my mom passed away in a rodeo accident at, well, I can't even remember how old she was, but in uh, 2016 is when she passed away in that rodeo accident. So and your, so your brother, it was during hockey season and they were going to Jasper for a hockey game? Was that the story? Uh, Hinton. Hinton, sorry. Hinton. Yeah. So if you're ever actually, it's right off the highway, right between the highways, just before Hinton, like 5K maybe, there's a set of um, hockey sticks that are across right between the ditches and that's exactly where the truck stopped and in that accident because they hit a moose yeah damn so that was obviously the first that's not easy losing a sibling obviously and no nope. <laughs> it's uh yeah it was uh it was a roller coaster ride from there what was, what was the reaction though when you like when you hear the news and because like, you were, th- be were you 13 yeah so i was 13 so my honest like reaction right off the bat was just just numb that's just like there's no way this is real and then from there, it kind of trans- transitioned into, you know, like I seen my parents that were grieving actively. And I kind of tried to fill some pretty, like, unbelievably big shoes and just ultimately be the, I don't even know how you want to say this, but the support system because, like, both my parents were grieving actively and somebody kind of had to hold the family together. And... Like, I mean, I know the story. Like, I know your parents separated a, a short time after that. Was that was that a big part of it? Um. Well, yeah. So, like, I don't know how much I want to get into this exactly. Yeah. But yeah, we don't have to. Um, no, we can, for sure. I just don't know. There's so many different directions it can go. Um. So, my mom, after my brother passed away, it probably took her, like, nine years before I finally seen that spark in her eyes. Like, it, she just was a wreck and it was like just before christmas so like every year at christmas it was just like just a disaster Yeah, that's super tough right yeah Yeah. so like between the two of them them they didn't last very long after that so my dad um they like separated and then my dad ended up kind of going a different direction in life altogether um and i always just kind of i don't know probably because my mom was softer than my dad a little bit probably um, I always stayed on my mom's side and I don't know if that's maybe fair to say, but I just, she was grieving openly a lot harder than he was. So I kind of felt like I had to, like I said, hold it together. Yeah. And, and I guess with the fact that your mom was like super involved in the Western side of things, that probably kind of was something you guys could do together in that process, right? Yeah. Well, and actually it kind of like, so in the book I'm, I'm writing, it's kind of neat to see all of the stages of grieving and stuff like that I went through. And um, so rodeo, ever since the get-go, was always how I dodged and deflected, like, emotions and stuff. So circling back around to, like, when I was at those bullfights in Ontario, you asked me, like, that picture you're talking about with Kobe took, that was shortly after Mom passed away. And I actually wrote about this in my book, and because I remember Wacy Finkbinder asked me, he's just like, man, how did that feel? Because that bull hooked me. And I'm like, I never said this openly because I'm, you know, in, in our culture, it's tough to, you know, admit that you're struggling. But like, I remember, I'm like, oh, it wasn't that bad. I just kind of brushed it off. But in my head, I'm like, man, that was nothing compared to what I'm feeling like on the inside. And mm-hmm. like that bull can hook me and hook me and hook me. And it won't feel near as bad as what I'm dealing with on the inside of me. Crazy. So that's the that's the answer to what you're asking, like what it felt like. I'm like nothing. Yeah. Like that bull can, yeah. Like I said, just keep hooking me, and you know everything on the inside is a lot worse going on. And and then so so we I guess transition out of that, you know, it obviously, yeah, like you say, you're, you're feeling like you're holding holding together and helping be part of the grief process with your mom and and family stuff, and then. You know, so you reference in there that your mom passed away. So maybe we'll we'll go to that. That was tough. I and I and I got grew close to your mom too when you when we started doing the rodeo together. And your mom was an awesome lady, and she got into a wreck in the steer and decorating in Hinton in yeah. July. Correct? So yeah, so that um, the horse she was steer and decorating steer cut what her year, off. What year was that again? Uh, Two thousand sixteen. Sixteen. Okay. Yeah. Steer cut her off, and she went head over heels, and. Uh, was basically in a vegetative state in a coma for like two weeks. Um, but so that's, you guys are circling, like asking me about the ponies. So in all of that time frame, the ponies was easier to push because I couldn't get enough gigs fighting bulls to 
dodge and deflect all of my emotions. So I essentially didn't deal with any of my emotions, and I just kept pushing the ponies harder and harder and harder. And that's why and how it got so busy um, was because I just used them as a defense mechanism, I guess, in, you know, just so I didn't actually have to feel any of those emotions. I just was busy all the time. Yeah, you're always always busy and always on the go. When a guy's busy, a guy doesn't have to think too much. So, so that was so 2016 um that happened and that would have been but you were you would have still been in the like you would have been ponying bullfighting you were doing everything when that happened right? yeah and then so all, all the business was ro- was rolling and, and your mom was a part of that because you guys put on some events together and yeah and then like a lot of people like a lot of guys didn't understand the pony thing um but like mom bought me the first couple ponies so when it was time to transition out of the pony deal I had a hard time with it because it was just like, you know, I'm, if I duck out of the ponies, it's like I'm losing my mom and parts of her again yet. So that's why I held on to it for so long. Because it was something you guys had together. Yeah. Yeah. Like she was basically my first, you know, how many events, how many events did you and your mom put on together? Because she was part of doing the stampede with you and. Yeah. And Uh, not a lot, but we probably put on five, maybe give or take. Yeah. Well, I'll never forget the 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 year you did the bull riding in. It was going to be at the rodeo grounds, the Stampede grounds in Edson, May long weekend. Yeah, I was coming from Marathorpe, and it was a complete whiteout blizzard, and it was the Sunday of May long, and you somehow got a bull riding arena built inside the what is that? It's like the equestrian indoor at Edson. What? Yeah, we had this little barn basically. They did indoor stuff with, um, but yeah, that. What year was that? That was so. That was the last year my mom was alive. So yeah, that was, so that was 2016. That was May of 2016, right? Yeah, because yeah. we did the Edson Stampede, and that was always in May, in the outdoor. You know, that was a Wild Rose Rodeo, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah and then because your mom hired me for that, that's that was one of the first ones that me and her worked together on. I hired you. Let's well, just you be ha- real. Uh, <laughs> I still have the Facebook messages or had the Facebook messages from your mom saying, "Would you come?" Probably because she wasn't sure if you'd actually phone me or not, because <laughs> she was like. The contingency. Yeah. So we, um, so yeah, we put that rodeo on for two years and then we didn't get a lot of help for it. So I was just like, well, if I'm putting all this effort in, it kind of was about the same time I was trying to like fight bulls even harder. So we put on a PBR that first year and that's why, because I was just, I needed to fight bulls more and I was kind of over fighting bulls at the amateur level. Nobody was hiring me yet, so I'm like, oh, I'll just keep building my own events, I guess, if that's the route a guy has to go. And you did. <laughs> so we did the PBR in the in that barn that year, and then was it 2017, the first year in the hockey rink in Edson that you put on the PBR there in the freestyle bull fight? Yep. Uh, 2017, we put on the first bull ride in the hockey rink, BRC, that year, just because um, the extra costs, we had to cut costs a little bit on production just you know move into a hockey rink so there's extra rentals dirt all that stuff um so we went to a brc instead and uh yeah it went super successful was that the year the power went out yeah i think so i remember picking up a there's a picture somewhere if i have like a traffic cone like an orange traffic cone that had a hole in it (laughs) and the power went out in the there was like forest fires or something and i was like screaming through this like pylon and the arena was packed because you good always wear your voice out. You always filled it. You always filled the event. Yeah, it was always. I was a little nervous, so the first year we went to a two day event in twenty eighteen. I think I was a little nervous that year, the first day, because it was like ten minutes out, and uh, we were probably only like third capacity, maybe at that. But it was a beautiful May long weekend. It was a gorgeous night, and yeah. we're like, uh oh. Oh no! Is anybody but then it filled show up. up. Then it yeah. filled up. And you had like a beer pong tournament that year, didn't you? Didn't you run out a buckle for a beer pong? Yeah, well, and that's just, we're trying to do shit different all the time <laughs> to try and get people to come to our events. And uh, that in 2017, we didn't get very many people stick around for the beer gardens. So in 2018, I'm like, well, it's a two-day event, so we need more people to stick around to cover costs. So I talked to Tyrell Jensen, and he uh, made two custom beer pong buckles. And we had a beer pong tournament after the bull ride and just to hopefully try and keep people around. It worked. It was pretty deadly, yeah. yeah. 
Was Shea that? always tells you he got screwed because Shea probably should have won that bull, right? <laughs> that buckle. Was uh, was that the year the 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 bullfighter? I can't remember what his name was. He was a First Nations feller, and he was he, so he, he was a rather large, and he got wedged under the fence. Remember I that video? Uh, yeah. So I always try and you know, like I said, go big with everything. So that bullfight was a it was a ten man bullfight, and so I'm like, well, for having the biggest bullfight in Canada, I had to call the biggest bullfighter in Canada. And so I call this guy, ask for his jersey size, and then I call the guy that put our jerseys on, and I'm just like, like how big can these jerseys get? Because like dude was like three XL, and it was tight. He was a big boy, but he got wedged under the panel, so he was literally stuck like with the panel over top of him. The bull pushed him underneath, and he couldn't. He was right underneath it. That was one of the most unprofessional things I've ever seen Dustin do. He was laughing on the I live, laughed on the mic. On the live mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a video of that somewhere. But oh, I couldn't no. help it. Like, I was seeing what I saw. Just, I was just getting hooked under the fence, and Dustin's on the live mic laughing. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to say his name, and, like... It wasn't I, long after that. We hired out somebody else. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was fired. <laughs> I was fired. Actually? No. Me and Sean Morton actually won the Calcutta that year. We bought the pan of bulls in the short go and oh, really? cleaned up. Edson always treated us well. <laughs> we enjoyed it. Uh, it all worked, though. Like, Frig, that's, you know, kind of circling back a little bit here. It's, like I said, I had to work four times as hard to get half the events of some of these guys. And, like, those bull ridings and stuff was, like, no joke. That was a task. Yeah, that was a big task. So now I want to go to a story. Well, it's a story from this exact same event. Um, where you took the unconventional exit from your own bull riding. Can we speak to that a little bit? Yeah, we Let's can. Let's talk so, about what happened here. <laughs> I that, that was probably the rankest I've ever fought bulls in my whole career. And I only fought about seven bulls of that bull riding. Because let's talk about what happened. Yeah, so I was always joking every time Curtis... Um, was asking about bringing bulls or whatever, and I'd always joke, bring the meanest ones, bring the meanest ones, you know, just because, just a hungry... But this is, you were cowboy protecting at this point. Yeah, so just a hungry bullfighter. So, just fighting lights out, and I remember pretty much all of it, except for one little spot in the middle. So I remember Ashton Sully got on this real bad hook ass, and I go in, make a pick, and like, dirty deep, like, that bull, like, touched my nipples, basically, with his horns. And he didn't come. So I'm like, all right, bet. So the next time he come around, I just laid on his head. I'm like, you're either coming with me, through me, or over me. Like, I don't care, but you're coming. And you're not camping over him. Bull pops me with his left foot in the mouth. Good night, Jim Kite. Like, <laughs> you were you were out cold. Stars. Or uh, I was convulsing so bad it took three people to come like to I hold remember. me down. I was on the mic. I remember. And like Derek Adams later told me he's like that was we thought we killed you, and turns out you can't. <laughs> um, but anyways, we had to get stars to Edmonton. It was so bad. And I remember thinking like, holy shit, like you just you lost your mom, your brother, you're putting on events, you're getting stars out of this, you're on the bull riding ascension i'm thinking how bad <laughs> like, like this guy's got a goddamn bad luck going on here but the one funny part about the story and sean reminded us of this today was ctv news had they had sent you a message yeah they were trying to get a hold of me they were trying to get a hold of the organizer of the bull riding so they could find so out how, could the, bullfighter how the bullfighter was doing <laughs> so ctv was reaching out like how do we get a hold of uh this organizer, Travis James, to find out how the bullfighter is doing, they got hurt at his event. Yeah, just, and he's in know, the hospital in Edmonton. Meanwhile, currently catching up on sleep because it was a lot of work to put that bull run together. Because you were you were uh, KO'd. Yeah, and uh, so you get stars air ambulance instead of that bull riding. Yeah, that was a doozy. I actually, so I remember, I woke up in the hospital. But Dustin, you you didn't laugh on the mic that. I time. didn't laugh on the mic that time. No, I remember thinking like. Jesus, Fuck. we killed this guy. We killed him off, and this has been a rough go for Travis James here, and this isn't helping things. So that happens. So the next year, I actually reached out to the same CTV news reporter to see if she wanted to give me some you know, promo leading up to the bull riding <laughs> this year, and she wanted no part of it. So I'm a little upset with them guys over yeah, that. Yeah, you don't, there's no bad press, but, like, come on. Yeah. You took a ride in a helicopter. And then... 
So at the end, like a New Year's Eve, you know how everybody makes those Facebook posts about how their year went? Yeah. And I made mine, and I'm like, there was even a helicopter snuck in this year. <laughs> helicopter ride snuck in this year. Now, <laughs> not that this is like, okay, let me let me preface this with like, we're friends, and like we joke around, and, and we said nothing was off limits, but this wasn't your first Stars helicopter ride. That one actually was. What? Or, th- I mean, this, or, sorry, it wasn't your last. That's what I went to see. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't your last. You, you end up in in one again, and it's, uh, I, I'm not saying this, like, as a joke, but, like, it it was your first of your s- s- two rides. So, if you're ever going to. So, is this our segue? If you're going to ever hop on a helicopter, I'll just start it by this, saying Kay. this. If you're ever going to be in a helicopter, I recommend you go to, like, Vegas or somewhere, pay for the tour, because the two times I was in the helicopter, not fun. Not it, fun. It hurt both times. Bad. Yeah. So, is it? Can we go to that story now? Yeah, is that, we is can. Is that okay? We can touch on that and and you know this is and not a lot of people, maybe not a lot of people know the story, maybe, and some do. I know you have spoke about it and and you're pretty open about it, or at least around around us. Um, but maybe take us back to when when it all happened and so and, and, and what it was and kind of circle back. So I kind of touched on, I wasn't properly dealing with my mental health after both my mom and my brother passed away. So I was just dodging and deflecting for all I was worth. And I used the ponies. And then shortly after mom passed, I bought a bunch of fighting bulls and I was just going as hard as physically possible to avoid having to stop and feel any sort of emotion. 2020 rolls around. And then COVID. COVID. I'm just going to say this. Sean can edit it out if he has to. COVID's a cocksucker. So it basically shut down all of the rodeos and took away the only coping mechanism I had. And I was not prepared to feel a lot of those emotions I was dealing with or suppressing or however you want to do that. And then kind of like just before COVID happened, I invested a large sum of money because I had a good summer lined up. And I, you know, me being the great businessman I am, I went high risk, as high risk as possible with that investment, like 50 grand or something, like a lot. COVID hit, no income from rodeos. And that 50 grand that I put in was suddenly only worth five. I'm like, we are not in good shape here. And and not to mention, you've got um, pens full of fighting bulls. Yeah, ponies, so pens full of fighting feed, bulls. No events. No events. No income. And like a lot of people don't realize this, but in that whole time frame, the rules, they were shutting down horse sales. So like I couldn't even offload all of them ponies if I wanted to. So I had no money coming in. I couldn't get rid of them. Because who really wants a buck and pony yeah. other than, you know, me and, you, you know, three other versions <laughs> of myself. So it was like, we are, there is like no hope here at all. I kept hanging on to the fact that, you know. They, by summer. Yeah. Well, they were talking about it was only going to be like a couple weeks. <laughs> yeah. And you I'm like. flatten the curve. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I can ride this out for a couple weeks, you know, have all of my good events are at the end of summer. What the hell did you invest in that you that went down to five grand? It was like a TFSA maybe or something. Like I just went high as high risk as possible. At the bank, so it was a mutual fund. Yeah, and it was just suddenly <laughs> worth nothing. Jeez, did you sell it or keep it? I kept it, so I got my money back eventually. But it yeah. was like yeah, everybody's. I remember. I still remember when the COVID knocked everybody's investments. I down. called there my was... uncle and I'm like, "This has got to be like a glitch in their system." Oh man, I, the, the stock like market's this. lost huge. Oh, a ton. Everything yeah. dropped. I'm like, there was guys is... who were set to retire that had to keep working. You know? Yeah. So like me, being the great businessman I am, my slush fund I put into this investment because I had all these contracts. Yeah, it's we we call it like rodeo credit. We all yeah. did it that year, right? It's like, oh, I got this rodeo, this rodeo, and this rodeo. I got this much money. Yeah. By the end of August, it's coming. In, it's coming in. So, yeah. anyways, I remember it clear as day. So. I don't remember her name though, but that one doctor she posted that no fares. Hinshaw, fest- yeah, she Hinshaw posted- and her horrible haircuts. She posted on online that there was gonna be no fairs or festivals for the rest of the summer. I'm like, so 
all of my hope went out the window. I reached out to a couple people, like a couple businesses, acquaintances, or whatever, just to see. Because I, like, even my job wasn't in great place there. It's just to see if there was, like, any hope of, you know, getting a better job or whatever. And everybody was just like, no. So, like, we were in a dark, dark, dark place. And there was no hope left. So, I ended up going out to the bush. And I shot myself right in the heart with a 22 and um yeah it's absolutely a miracle that i'm here today to even talk on this podcast because i miss dying by well first it took like people three hours to come find me like i was not in a good place was it uh was it manning's that found you yeah so jay ended up finding me um because you owned a quarter of land right oh yeah oh so you didn't do this at home you went out no, I, like, I'm kind of, yeah. So I tried to do all of my chores, tried to take the burden off everybody else because I wanted, you know, they were all going to be grieving. So I made sure all of my chores were done. But in the middle of doing my chores, I got my tractor stuck. And I'm just like, man, I can't do anything right. So I made sure my dog was fed, left him at the house. And uh, I remember, actually, I drove by Jay's place. And I remember just looking at, out the window and just like, man, just crying the whole time. This is the last time I'm going to see this guy. And, uh, yeah, I went out to the bush, made a few text messages, shut my phone off, and one, two, three, pulled the trigger, and that was her. And, yeah, it's, like I said, it's a miracle. Because, like, so I miss dying by the width of a fingernail. And I miss being paralyzed for life by half the width of a fingernail. And... I can't even make this shit up. Like, it's wild. That is wild. It's super heavy. It's crazy. Um, what, what was your, what was your headspace though? And like, was it, was it, was it, was there some alcohol involved to like get yourself to that point or were you dead sober and dead sober? And like, I even asked, I knew I was going to do it earlier in the day. And I even asked my boss what, what time to show up to work the next day, just so that didn't raise any alarms. And uh, so after all said and done, I actually, ha- they, I spent three weeks, I call it the Looney Bin, but it's actually the Alberta Hospital. That's in Pinocchio? Uh, in a, in Edmonton. Or in Edmonton. And because that was their biggest concern, that I went the most aggressive way possible, and then there was no alcohol or nothing involved. Because most people, it's like they get drunk, they go on a drug bender. That was what I was assuming, yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, but there was just, there was no hope left in the world. And it's just like, so my brother, when he passed away, the moose, his horn was broke off. And uh, it stabbed him right in the heart. So it was. I was told he went super quick, super fast. And so, yeah, I did not. It fucking hurt. It was the most painful thing I've done in my whole life. And all I remember was one, two, three, pulled the trigger, and just my ears were ringing. And I was just numb, like buzzing. And I was just, I could think, I could hear, I could, I don't know if I could talk or not, but um, all I could think of was, well, that didn't work. And now so we you got never f- you never passed out at all? I probably did. Um, it's hard to say because I was kind of in and out. Like I, I didn't start, so this is how crazy it is. I didn't start bleeding out because I landed in, in the recovery position. I didn't start bleeding out until they moved me. No shit. Yeah. And so it's just... That's how crazy it is because, like, it was a through and through. And that morning, I even looked at a chart to see where my heart was just to make sure I didn't miss. And I have a tattoo on my chest now where the bullet hole is. And thank God that chart I looked at was off because it was exactly where it was. It's not like I tried to... Because some people, they try and, like, pull away halfway and, like, oh, I changed my mind. I did, I did not miss. And that's the sketchy part about it all. So when once you realize that you were still alive and that it didn't work at the time or you're conscious and you realize what's just happened, like, did you have a sense of, like, thank God it didn't happen, like, at, in that moment? In that moment, it was kind of just trying to survive, I guess. Because um, you... After that, like, were you like, geez, now I hope I, like, 
while you were still conscious, like, I hope someone finds me. Yeah, like, I I kind of wiggled over enough to get to my phone. Um, I called my buddy's mom, Mike's mom, and I was just, because it went through my lung, too, so I was kind of grasping for air, and I remember talking to her and be like, Nina, I screwed up, and that's kind of all I could get out. And uh, This is Michael Stashik. Yeah, yeah, and, like, this is how crazy it is. I, I had like a couple options of who I could have sent the, the text message to. If I would have sent it to Mike, like no no knock on Mike, but I wouldn't be here today because Mike went golfing that day and put his phone away. Really? Oh, yeah, so I sent it to a friend. This was like middle of the day? Like 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock at night maybe. And and what time of the year? Was it May, June? like? Uh, April 20th. April. Yeah. 420. So... Maybe April twenty fifth. I'm not okay. So sure. what spur? So what spurs on then the search for you? Because did they know you were out there? Did anyone know you were out there? Yeah. So I sent it to a friend, and uh, I kind of gave her some clues as to where to find me. Um, like before you did it. Yeah, and so like I I sent it via Facebook Messenger, um, just because I wanted to make sure she got it, and. Cause like, so this is kind of all that was going through my head. Like I was actually scared cause I went through quite a few, like I had quite a few concussions leading up to that. And it was kind of like sh- shortly after Ty's deal. And so I was nervous that my head might have something to do with it. So that's why I went, shot myself in the heart because I wanted to leave my brain intact, you know, if they could ever do some stuff. So I kind of sent this lady a bunch of messages and, you know, like told her all this stuff and like where to find me and stuff. And I sent it Facebook messenger because I have an Android and I wanted to make sure that she got it, waited for her to get it. And then instantly I shut my phone off so that there was no way they could call me and talk me out of it. Cause like my mind was made up. This is the path we were going to go down and yeah. What what were you thinking though to to get to that point? Like I I just got to go back to like, did you talk to people and ask for help or like how did how did you get to a place where you didn't think there's any hope left? Well, so I kept reaching out to a bunch of people and like I was just kind of vaguely be like, yeah, we're in a pickle, like, you know, no income or whatever, but it kind of got muffled out because everybody was in the same situation, right? So it's like I I could call you and complain about no events, but you guys were all feeling the stress of it too. Mm-hmm. So I it's made, like no nope. hundred dollars. I made a hundred dollars in May of 2020. So when I cash, like when I paid my, uh, so that year when I went in to do my taxes, it was like six grand I made, and five of it was from like a government grant. And my accountant's like called me instantly. Did you, uh, did you miss a bunch of stuff? And I'm like, honestly, man, I'm surprised I even made that much. That was your <laughs> whole year was six thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, like it was a hit, and so like I was always reaching out to people and. And uh, lots of times people weren't even texting me back. Um, lots of times people were still doing it. Like, they were like, oh, yeah, we're feeling the crunch of it, too. Like, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. I'm like, I, like I'm getting a pickle here. Like, I, and, But everybody was feeling the same thing. So everybody kind of just brushed it off to the point where I'm almost like, I have no idea. I wasn't even eligible for any government grants at that point in time. Just the way they doled them out. So it was like, I... There is nothing left in here, and I don't know what or who to talk to or who to ask for help, and yeah, so that's just kind of, just there was no hope at all, zero. Yeah, I mean, I, I can rem- I can think back to that time, and every time any of us had that conversation, we were all like, no, weren't recognizing it was harder on you than the next guy because we were all doing the. We got no rodeos. We're all, yeah. none of us, I just got, I just had this booked and this booked and it's not going. And then Calgary Stampede's not going. And it was like, it was tough to recognize that you were hurt and better, worse than the other guy. And this sounds kind of like, almost like not, not bad. Insensitive. Okay. Let me just, let, insensitive in a way, right? But it's. Let me just butt in here. And I think so on the mental health advocacy side of life, when you're struggling that bad, you just got to be blunt with people and be like, man, no, like it is like seriously. Because people, how how are you guys supposed to know what's going on in my head if I'm, like, tiptoeing around it yeah, and, that's like, fair. all that side of things? You're like, no, dude, I'm struggling, and I don't know what to do. Yeah, because there's a or, difference. Or I'm having suicidal thoughts, yeah. like, 
I yeah. need help. Yeah. help There's me. a difference between two guys like us BSing in March saying, geez, I really hope our events come back that we're going to yeah. do. Because hopefully we can, s- we can get something by May or June or July or August. Hopefully we can get, s- get some yeah. checks rolling here and, and yeah. the fact like, hey, my mental health shit. I've lost my mom, my brother. I'm not coping. I lost all this money and I'm having suicidal thoughts. Those are two very different dialogues. Yeah, exactly. Right? So like I said, you got to just be blunt and like you guys, how are you supposed to know? I've actually had this conversation recently um, with management um, on stuff like that. I'm like, if I'm not honest with you guys and I don't tell you what's going on, I'm like you guys can't just guess. Like, like how are you management of work or what do you mean? Yeah, well, so I had, I don't know, what you, how do you call this? But I had an episode three months ago maybe now where we got a new manager at work. And part of his protocols are, as pen checkers, we're supposed to do postmortems on cattle. If you don't know what postmortem is, basically it's when you cut the cow open, take a bunch of pictures, and find out why it died. A cow autopsy. Yeah. I found out the hard way that I can't do them. Because it brings back... I didn't even know I had PTSD from all of this. Turns out I do. And when I found out, like I almost puked at work the one day... And the manager was just like, well, it's, you know, it's part of your job. And so I kind of tried to tiptoe around it, tiptoe around it. We did a second one, and I'm like, I can't do this. And so we have an HR department. Hats off to them. I talked to them, and I'm like, okay, this is what's going on. I'm not trying to duck this. But I, like, I can do everything else here at the feedlot, but I can't do this. So I had a meeting with the manager, and uh, I just even opened it with, like, I need to be more transparent with you guys because how are you guys supposed to know what's going on in my head unless I tell you? So this is what's going down. I can't do these because it takes me back to just like hovering over top of myself, watching myself bleed out, and it's not healthy for me. So what can we do to not put me in this situation? And, yeah, so that was just like – that was just recently, like three months ago maybe. And – Four or five years ago, you never would have wanted to have, you wouldn't have had that conversation. Yeah, I would have tried to just duck, duck. I would have probably quit my job, honestly. Or, you know, just try to battle through it to a point where. Which doesn't put you in a good spot battling through it. And like my counselor, because I I struggled with it. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm 30. I'm physically fit. I'm, you know, I'm strong enough to do all this stuff, but I like, I, I can't do it. And he's just like, well, essentially, that is. Like that is not that's a not safe work environment for you, because your mental health is just important as your physical health. Yeah. It's not that you're ducking it by no means. It's just you can't do it. So you got to have these conversations with the right people, and yeah, and then just kind of go from there. And then we can touch back on this in the future if it comes up again. And uh, I got to go back to your seeing yourself from above like that. I haven't heard of many people talk about that before, but that didn't happen until you started bleeding out once they moved you, once somebody found you. Yeah, so it only happened, like, so when we cut the cow open, if you hit some arteries or whatever, the cow bleeds out. So it just kind of, like, put me back in in memory lane. I don't know if you want to call it that, but that's all I could think about in that time. And Like, oh, this is probably what I looked like back then. Oh, okay. It wasn't, it wasn't that you went back to... See, where, having that memory of you were no no okay yeah no it was it was more just like this is probably what I looked like at that point in time yeah. in my life and it was like it was a lot who who did find you eventually you said it was Jay I think you said yeah it was uh, Jay Manning Jay Manning uh, Shelly Manning and I don't even honestly know who there's a pile of people like probably like 20 of them probably because I was I and was, it took them three hours to find you you said yeah, well, um, no, it took probably two hours to find me, um, but then it was another hour to just fish me out of the bush because I went in quite a ways. Holy shit! And then they stars there amongst you. F- yeah, like I remember they're carting me out of there. And, and who, who's they? Like paramedics by this point, or uh, no, we weren't even to the paramedics yet. Holy shit! So they were all kind of had me on a stretcher because it's crazy, man. Like the lady that lived. Across the road from my quarter was a, a medic. So, like, she had a spine board and everything. No kidding. 
And so they called her, they got her spine board, and then they started packing me out of the bush. But I was a ways in there. And once they started moving me, like once they moved me, then I could literally feel myself bleeding out. And they were kind of like, do we take him to the Edson Hospital or do we call STARS? And I was just like, STARS, STARS, please call STARS. Like I knew where I put that bullet and I knew we were kind of already at that point on borrowed time. So it's like, let's just take me to STARS. And you know, let guys. I'm a, I'm a. I got a frequent flyer pass. Yeah, it's be my second time on Stars. Let's just, you know, hopefully we don't go on a third time. Yeah. If I'm, I'll donate to Stars. But <laughs> yeah, knock on wood. No kidding. Yeah. So, and then they take you to Edmonton from there, right? Yeah, they took me from Edmonton from there, and uh, yeah, I kind of remember waking up in the hospital. They're taking the breathing tube out of my mouth. Like, how how long was that? How long were you? Uh, how long did they have you out for? I guess then, would have been a bunch of surgeries. Probably two days. I had to get one surgery, and like a pile of blood transfusions and shit. How much blood did you lose? Did they say? Or how Probably many like transfusions? Probably sixty-nine percent of it. Oh really? Like quite a bit. Huh. <laughs> I see what you. <laughs> he picked <joking>. sixty-nine. <laughs> he picked sixty-nine for sure. Okay, so I. It's not a laughing matter. Let's be real about this. But that's how I cope with my mental health is I dodge and deflect. And I apologize if I offend anybody. And it's probably not the healthiest way to deal with it. But, but that's how. But as long as you're, that is, if that is helping you, like, do you feel like it helps? Like, it I think so. The only thing I, I'm worried about, if anything, was because it is a serious matter. Um, like, and I don't want to accidentally trigger anybody from not taking it serious, right? That would be my only concern. S- since we're talking about, can I tell this story about the ghost emoji? I think so. Yeah. Since since we're, since that is your that is your, uh, the way you communicate and your your personality. So, I don't know how long it was after. Well, okay. How did you hear all about out, out about Mike? It? So he just called you or texted you or what? Texted me, yeah. Michael Sashik texted me to tell me. I was just blunt about it or what exactly? Well, yeah, it was kind of like here's what's going down. Because knew that we were close and friends, and and so I think told Sean Morton too. When did you hear about it? When did you hear about that? It then, that night. The same day. The okay. same night. Yeah, yeah. And then, but your phone was. Sh- when did you get? When did you get your phone back? When did you get access to your phone? How many days after? Probably about a week, maybe. Yeah, because I think, I think we were talking about how we could get a hold of you, or talk to you, and then all of a sudden, and like, it was during COVID, so like nobody could even come in and yeah, visit. Yeah, everything was on lockdown. Like it was super awesome. Because I think I had a picture. You sent me a picture of Sean outside your window. Yeah, Sean. Sean, Sean was the only person that came. Yeah, and uh, we waved through the window. He brought me some. Yeah, some Sour Patch Kids in a magazine. Yeah, great but, guy. So back to this. So we're kind of like, well, when, like, I don't know what the next steps are when this happens, right? Like, how do you? What do you text somebody? Like, hey, man, glad you're okay. Like. Can't come see you. Can't do nothing. Because well, you guys didn't even know been, if I was serious. Like, if I still wanted to go back and do it again. Yeah. Or. Yeah. And we had been talking previous to that, like, just same thing about like nothing going on, right? Like, because you had canceled the bull riding, and then all of a sudden I get a text <laughs> from Travis's phone, and all it is is the ghost emoji. No context. Nothing. No context. <laughs> That's my first communication from Travis after this whole incident, and I look at my phone and it's just ghost emoji, and I'm like. Jesus. It was like, it was almost like a sense of relief in a way. I didn't have to send the first message, which I should have manned up and said something, but I didn't know if you had your phone, whatever. I can't make excuses. Well, and that's like, I was was like, on my end, I wasn't sure. Like, okay, I'm, I went out with a bang. And so everybody knew, like everybody were heard what happened. I'm like, I come out of this, man. People are going to just tiptoe around me like a fool. I'm like, so let's just get over and done with. I'm going to send them this sick text, but at least then, hopefully, from my point of view, you guys know I'm kind of back. Yeah, that's and that's what it was kind of the relief was. It's like, okay, he sends a ghost emoji. Like, yeah, I'm back, baby. <laughs> I mean, still got a lot of work mentally to yeah, yeah. not go down that path yeah. again, but yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I sent it to you and I sent it to Dom, and it, like, I think it freaked Dom out a lot. Like, he did not handle it quite as well as... <laughs> I thought he was gonna. Cause then, and then when you were in Edmonton in the Alberta hospital, then we were able to chat on the phone and stuff and, and chat through it and and, but it, it is it's like, it's it's awkward, it's uncomfortable because you don't you as a in your shoes and someone that's trying to talk to you it's like always it's like 
walking by your ex-girlfriend for the first time. It's like, what yeah. are you saying? I remember, here? so I did a podcast with Brett, and, like, the first yeah. 10 minutes of it was just, like, man, can we just get to it? Because, like, this, you're tiptoeing around this like a fool. Yeah. And, and, be, and it's hard for people to talk about, no matter who you are, right? Yeah. Like, well, what's, what do you say? You can't, hey, man, really. Uh, glad you're still here, and sorry yeah, you I'm, shot yourself. Like, Glad your aim sucks. Like, Yeah. You're a horrible marker. <laughs> yeah. Harry, like there's you're a horrible shot. There's no there's no real good way to have that conversation. No. So that's why and I, I did hope it. I'm not sounding insensitive because Travis's humor and like this is how I hope I didn't sound insensitive. I mean he lost sixty nine percent of his blood. Yeah. Sixty nine. <laughs> but this is how you've kind of dealt with it, right? Yeah, exactly. Like I'm just gonna be blunt about it. We're gonna talk to people and just have real conversations with people. Cause like I said, how do you know what's going on if you don't like you can't guess, man. Yeah. What was the reaction from the rodeo community? Like, what were you surprised by the by the by people reaching out? Were you were you expecting different? Like, I know it was a really tough time in COVID. But what was what what was the reaction from the people that surrounded you in the events when things were good? Um, there was a lot of support. I had a couple friends that were just real blunt. They're like, because they're just like, oh, they'd see Snapchats. So they're like, what are you doing in the hospital? I'm like, oh, I shot myself. And they're like. On purpose or on accident? I'm like, no, on purpose. And then they're like, oh. And I'm just like, okay, let's have this conversation. I'll tell them what happened. And, you know, no sense of tiptoeing around it at this point because, you know, like how you have to have that conversation with people. Yeah. But it's it's human nature for it to be tough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, I would say for the most part, people were, they received it pretty well. I mean, lots of people are like, oh, poor Travis, like, your life just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So that's kind of why I'm so extravagant on the outside. It's just like, cause I don't want to live under those shadows, right? Like I want to be, I want people to remember me for the good things in life and the, the positive impacts I'm making. I don't want to just be that sad story that everybody looks at and feels guilty for. That's fair. So yeah. Um, Maybe that's, Yeah. That's yeah. So everybody was pretty good about it. I guess that's the best way to put that. But but you know, I I heard someone say rodeo. Maybe this was heard the comment here recently. Like rodeos, something tell it's not. I can't remember. Rodeo's here for you. Tell it's not kind of thing. And 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 we see that. But would you say like you got a it was a good outpouring of support from the people in the rodeo community when when you needed it uh, after the fact? Like I I would say so. There's like fifty fifty maybe. Um, there's People that, like, you really found out who your friends were. Let's just get that out of the way with. Like, you, Sean, um, everybody else. Like, you really find out who's in your corner. And then it's crazy. The people that you thought were in your corner, they're, like, so awkward about it that they just, like, I don't... Like, they almost ducked out of my life because they were just, like... I don't know how to say this properly, but they were just... I don't know. They Can just handle didn't, it. Yeah, they didn't know how to handle it. I guess is probably yeah. the best way to put that. So, is this a good time to segue out of this? Like, I think we've probably touched on this. Probably. Is there anything else that you want to ask on that side of it? Well, I I just have to confess that I didn't know you very well before. Like, I, we always were in similar circles, but like, I feel bad for not having reached out. But I like I I wasn't as close as you guys were. Well, you and like I, you know. 98% of the rest of the world were well, yeah. and you want and with that rodeo has an interesting people relationship thing like we go to so many events with so many people and we cross paths so much and I'm on the mic saying people's names and telling their story and some of those people I don't even have a like I, I wouldn't even say like I'm friends with that person but we but we're we're in so many places so often that everyone like assumes like we're this like super tight knit everybody knows everybody community but I would say that that's not true because like what our paths would only cross right. like because you were WRA. doing yeah and you were doing sound at those pbr events yeah. and like we never we just didn't cross you know. paths a ton no exactly yeah and, and and like i i probably feel weird because i've never really reached out but like i consider us friends i would you know, think so we talk on your Snapchat prices are a little your, your prices are a little high when it comes to advertising <laughs> <but they're enough. laughs> i want the friend discount <laughs> yeah. but i think that's fair to say that rodeo has a bit of a false sense of like some of it for sure of like friendship I don't know if that's the right word but you no, know what it's, oh and so okay so circle back go ahead so get this so when i 
and I don't even really like saying this. So the year that I got killed off at the bull ride in Edson, you know how many people reached out to me to see if I was okay? Five. Brenda Vold. That was it? That was One it. person? Yeah. She sent me a Tim Hortons gift card on behalf of the CPRA, and it happened at an open bull riding. Really? Yeah. Like, I would say you probably reached out, like, Sean, like, the really, like, the... Your the, friends. The, the five closest friends. I don't even know what happened either. Like, uh, like what happened there and what, like, I don't even remember what happened. Like, I don't know what the story is about your bull riding getting X'd out to go on Stars yeah. last time. Like, what happened that time? Oh, so I went in to make a save for Ashton. Ashton and, Solly? Yeah. And just got absolutely killed off and knocked out and... Mm-hmm. Yeah, stars to Edmonton, but yeah, but, like. But, they, but like, was that all? It was Did you, you got knocked out, or like, was there like a lung, or like, what? Why did they stars you? Uh, just because so he was conv- he was you were convulsing oh, in bad, the arena like for a bad concussion. Like it was bad. You were. I remember you went full yeah. stiff, and you were just and like, like because it was he popped me with his foot like in my in my teeth, and like just below my nose. Like there is so much blood. Yeah, oh, okay. it was really bloody. Okay. Yeah. By yeah. the time they realized they didn't like. We were kind of okay. It was kind of a little bit late, but it's better to be, especially with your head, it's better to be safe than sorry kind of thing. Fair. But yeah, like, so that's kind of an empty feeling when all these people you thought were friends, and you're, I'm like, as a bullfighter, I'm like, man, I put my life on the line to save you, and you could really care less about me. I'm like, so I kind of circled, like, so I started fighting bulls, like, for myself, and I always made sure that I was fighting bulls for the right reasons because a lot of these people, I am kind of don't like saying this, but I think a lot of people fight bulls for the to be famous. And a little bit of glory that comes yeah, with exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. That's fair. And so once I kind of realized like how the industry, you know, treats guys, I'm like, well, you know, I'm just going to keep fighting bulls because I love it and like not – get too wound up on that side of it because if you start going down that path, man, it eat you alive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think this is a, maybe now we segue to the, the comeback tour here. Is that, are we at a good spot, Ted, to we've chatted through kind of the, the, well, the, the low lows and well, I, and I got to ask about your lung. Like how the fuck does your lung heal up after you shoot a hole through it? Cause it went right in and out, right? And like, did you fuck up any ribs or like you said you almost paralyzed yourself? Does it, did you wreck a vertebrae back there? Or like, what are, what are the, what are the extent? I got about as lucky as physically possible. So basically, the actual diagnosis was I only grazed my heart, and it went through the bottom corner of my lung. So they just basically sewed my lung back together. And so I think that lung's not quite the same capacity as the other one, I would assume. But, yeah, like no... Yeah, like you could probably do that a million times over and have different outcomes. So the one lady that was a doctor said she worked um, in like Chicago or something in the ER. And she's only ever like where there's high, high gun. They shoot. They shoot. Yeah, exactly. She says she's only ever seen one person get that lucky out of like 10 years of working in Chicago ER. Like it's. It's crazy. And then not even that to come back and even be athletic after that. Like Yeah. Like I still fought bulls. I was in twenty twenty. I fought bulls for three more years after that. Yeah. And had like good good years. You fought the BRC finals after that, right? Did no. You? I uh I actually never fought the BRC finals. I, I was there. the alternate before that. Oh, okay, that's and what it was. you were there. On the politics side of things. They decided to only go with two guys, so I just sat on the back of the buck and shoots with a jersey on. That's right. I do remember you there, though. But I was there. I got out of finals with thirty guys. They have two fucking bull rider, bull yeah, fighters? The, like one of the only years Are they. You serious? Then they went to three. Yeah, right after yeah. they went to three before that and after that. I think it's just because they didn't like me, but that's what I tell myself. But the, that seems like horseshit, though. I, yeah, I'm not gonna talk. That on smells that. Like fishy. It, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> we'll move on. So. Okay, so I'm gonna segue it then because we've I think we've chatted about about the story and can I ask about the common goat? Yeah, ask about the common goat. What is the, what is the common goat? So <laughs> I went and bought all the Mexican fighting bulls with my mom's insurance money, and fighting bulls are probably the they're like little dinosaurs. They <laughs> just hate everything. Jurassic Park. Yeah, exactly. That's what my place looked like for a while, and so I was trying to figure out how to not die 
And so I I bought a little common goat like off of uh, Ferdinand. Yeah. I called mine Bob. Did it calm the bulls? Yeah, if he, he's actually got his own Instagram story on the Gringo Fighting Bulls <laughs> uh, Instagram page. Yeah, he would just lay a whooping on them and keep them in line. It was good watching. There's the common goat. Sorry, Dustin. What else did you? No, have? I was just Cut gonna. I wanted to go into because I think we've like talked about like the low stuff here and like some of the heavy stuff, but I think that you know it, it's an interesting story about how you got there and and you survived, essentially taking your own life. But you know, some people can go into a like stay in a dark place and like feel sorry for me and feel sorry for myself. And you like, you kind of grab the Mexican fighting bull by the horns. Well, and like, so I've said it before. And you and went into this really good place now. I'm actually, yeah, surprisingly in a really good place. Um, like as of today, but, uh, I've said it before in the past, like, so you go down all them dark paths, try to go down that route. doesn't work. And so, like, the way my brain is wired, it's just like, okay, we've got these problems. Let's solve them. Clearly, option A didn't work. <laughs> so, let's uh, let's try, like, option. I think we're, like, way down the alphabet now to, like, <laughs> D or C or, like, F or wherever now. Because, you know, C problem, adjust, fix problem. So, option A didn't work. So, it's like, okay, well, let's do whatever we have to do to not get back to that place. Like, heck, I was... Taking, I went to like a Reiki course one class one time, and she's just like, "Why are you here?" I'm like, "I don't know. I was told it's supposed to be good for your mental health." She's like, "Where are you sore?" I'm just like, "I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm trying absolutely everything in my power because I refuse to take legal drugs. No, I'm just kidding. I refuse to take all types of drugs, but uh, I refuse to take drugs to mask those emotions and those feelings." Because, you know, you go to a pharmacy or whatever, oh, I'm in a dark place, they just give you some drugs, cover it up, like a Band-Aid, basically. And I'm like, oh, no, we're going to dig down, we're going to do some serious, deep, dark work, figure out what caused this, well, we kind of already know, but figure out what to do moving forward so that, like I said, we don't go in to that place again. So I do all sorts of stuff. I regular see, regularly see a counselor. Um, not so regularly now, like probably my, still once every four months. Um, but like doing whatever has to happen so that we don't go down that path again. And so you're doing the work on that side, but um, doing the work, creating, you used to, I mean, you've always been an event producer, I guess, but now you've created this like crazy wild backyard zone well so i don't know if you guys remember it or not but it was looking like for a while there we were probably gonna have two summers of it i'm like that's not happening under no circumstances i will i need to make some money with these bulls and these ponies and i i'm not putting myself in a situation to go broke again i don't care what i have to do so that's how the element zone was born then yeah and so like i kind of named it the element zone so it's like because the concept behind it is like I'm in my element when I'm in my zone. So it's basically built on whatever the heck I think I'm good enough to do that will bring entertainment to the local community. Because the community kind of pays for all these events. And so it's element zone 13. The 13 symbolizes my brother's hockey number. And yeah, so we just started building events. Like we just had our 14th one. Um... That was a the couple, spring, yeah, the spring, spring fling just a couple weeks ago, and and it is currently built up to like so that one, just a couple weeks ago, we had like four hundred people out attending, so they're actually turning into. Once I had the first event, and I seen like oh there's real potential here, I started pushing hard, probably still relapsing to the point where I'm like, not dealing with my mental health, but we have that's why I still seek out counseling and stuff. And it's like, if I am pushing myself too hard hosting these events, call up Troy, have a session, figure out how to not revert back to old habits, because it happens, and just, you know, move forward. And these events you're doing, I guess, so from the outside looking in, the the, uh, <laughs> the evolution of them started, like, literally as backyard put-together redneck as you can get. 
Yeah, well, right? it's just like, okay, like I have all these. He did these, the bull riding. I have all these animals, so how do, what the heck are we going to do to have these events? Because so, you didn't have any infrastructure. It's not like you had an, a big arena I, in your backyard. And, and I had just a couple back pens that I, um, like for my squeeze and stuff, that to sort cattle to like haul them out to an event. So, I, and like I had some mini pony shoots and like I through that whole process I, I seen a friend had a set of buck and shoots in the bush at their place so I'm like just making all of these phone calls probably just begging pleading and you know just doing whatever I have to circling back to just still having events because I need to make money I have these animals I want to fight bulls but I don't have any of these opportunities anymore so we just started doing it and now you're so how many years is this the third summer of Element Zone coming up? Oh, uh, yeah. So this will be a third summer. Um, we're coming into our 14th event. Or 15th event, I guess. Yeah, 15th event. Um, I just recently, last fall, at the 13th event, um, I retired as a professional bullfighter so I could focus on this more. Because the last event we had about 800 people at over two days. Like, we had a band and, and uh, like, it's... I told myself in my mind, like, if I could start making X amount of dollars on this and having X amount of people at my events, that's when I'm going to st- stop trying to burn the candle at both ends. I'm like, I still love fighting bulls. Um, but, like, a guy can only push himself so hard without reverting back to old habits and stuff. So, at the 13th event, I uh, Dom was a little mad because I reti- I, uh, we started at 13 minutes late even. And... Uh, <laughs> I announced my retirement so I can start doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, uh, so I guess going back to that, you were still fighting professionally till this past year in the CPRA, fighting pro rodeos, fighting PBR, BRCs. So you were still, you were still giving her. Yeah. And the cool thing about that, so is I could go to all of these rodeos and take a little bit of each rodeo and, you know, add it into my infrastructure so I, every like I was just at a rodeo over the weekend, and I'm like, man, I feel actually I'm at a place now where, like, I don't really want to brag because that's not who I am, but I'm have a better facility than lots of people that have been having rodeos for like hundred years. Well, you've got uh, <laughs> this is a fun one. You got in on some online auctions. So tell us about some of the additions to the Element Zone that you've got in there because you've got some from some uh, pretty iconic rodeos. Yeah, so that's like, so we started having these events with only two buck and shoots, and it sucked because my budget, you know, everybody would just bring like calves for the bull riding. And if you guys have been to a bull, bull riding with just calves, they fight the box like bad. And if you only have two buck and shoots, you can't even roll back and forth to figure out, you know, to get somebody out. So, like, we had constantly would have all these lulls in our events. And uh, and then the set of bucket shoots from Pinoca, they just recently replaced their shoots, went up for bid. And uh, I scrounged together. I think I probably rolled a few coins. I <laughs> I sold all of my animals I could afford to sell and called in as many favors as I had left and uh, spent 9500 bucks and bought a brand new – well, they're not brand new, but they're new to me. Um, so I got five shoots now we work with. Um, that set came from the Pinocchio Stampede. And then, uh, like, my beer shed was just the announcer booth from the Jasper Pro Rodeo Grounds. And Is that an online auction, too? Yeah, online, too. <laughs> so I could be, like, at work making money, hustling, and then just, like, take a coffee break or go take a poop or something and uh, bid on on these things. <laughs> so you've got shoots. You said shoots one, two, and three from Pinocchio? Yeah. Yeah, so now we have five shoots, and then, They'd yeah. There have been some... Uh, been some stories in those shoots well, and the good thing with pinoco shoots one two and three are probably lightly used because they're at the front yeah they're yeah they've the been ends. they've been painted a pile of times by looks oh, of them. yeah like i got 17 <laughs> layers of paint on them if that a lot, of, a lot of red paint so you got the p the o and the n yeah <laughs> but so the cool thing about the red paint is so like my pony shoots that i used to have were red so they actually fit in color scheme wise didn't even have to paint them again exactly and you've got like you've had live music you've had um, six Finger Fritz? No, no Six Finger Fritz. Yeah, we haven't got the invite. Oh, yeah. You've had Dennis Halstead out there. Dom yeah. works a lot of your events. You've got beer gardens, like actually legit licensed. You've got power lights. Like you've put a ton of work and time into these 
events. Like this isn't, we always use the term bush rodeos, but this is, um, you know, you're, you're, you're putting the work in to make these events better. Well, and so like going to all these events and stuff, I'm not going to lie. I stole this idea from Cody Snyder. So my big premier event, cause I got to have something that, you know, keeps me legitimate from everybody. Otherwise, like you said, they're just gonna be like, Oh, you're having these bush roadies. You're just a bunch of rednecks shooting off fireworks, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, no, we're having like, we have an actual bull riding. Um, so I took a page out of Snyder's book. And, uh, so I turned my bull riding into mustachio bull bashio. Um, I've been over the last few years, I've been growing out a mustache. Um, things, things thick and by the way, yeah. So the idea is cheese puff stuck in everybody. No, the idea is good. to stash the stigma around men's mental health, use my story, use my platform, use what I think I'm good at. And, uh, raise money for nonprofit groups that support mental health. So we do this bull riding. Uh, the first year we did it, we raised just about $3,000 for the Center for Suicide Prevention. Uh, last year, there's a local group, because um, like that's a good cause and all, but I, like, I'd like to keep my money just a little bit more local. Um, so there's this local group just out of Hinton um, that does like meals and stuff uh, for homeless people, people struggling with their mental health. And so last year we raised uh, four thousand dollars for them, and uh, that's our next event. So it's coming up May twenty fourth, twenty fifth. Um, going back to that nonprofit group, raising some more money for them, doing things like, like I have some pictures of some fighting bulls that we blew up into a canvas, and then we raise, we auction them off during the event, and then we have like a mustache competition and like all sorts of random cool things with it. Some really cool buckles too. Yeah, through Montana. We ordered these buckles. <laughs> Shameless plug here for Montana. Yeah. Okay. Just saying. I'm See like the, the boot shop in Edson. I'm probably the only place in North America that has a legit mustache competition where the winner gets a buckle. The uh, I've got to say, though, the I saw one of these one time in West Texas. They had a mustachio, bobachio. Yeah, so I can't even take credit for that because that's where I stole that idea from. Yeah, but we're in Canada, so it's fine. Yeah, exactly. Like, no, it's like our ski race. The there was a big ski race. Mustachio, bobachio in Canada. Is yeah, in, the biggest one. That's yellow. Yeah. They, don't even, they might not even have that one anymore, so it's probably the biggest in North America. Yeah, so theirs is mustachio, bobachio, spelt one le- one word. Mine's just separated in the middle. Two words, yeah. <laughs> just for trademarks. Smart. State. Yeah, exactly. Smart move. Yeah. 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 But, but, uh, but still, sweet name. Yeah, and like I said, so it's all kind of stuff that I think I'm good at. I really like marketing of rodeos and stuff. Um, I think the current way most places market their rodeos is crap. They got to think outside the box a little bit more. And um, well, because you guys know, like rodeos are kind of. I don't want to call them dying off because they're not, but they're. Our fan bases are shifting. And we got to try and think outside the box to get different fans into our events. Because your events, you're probably getting like, you want young people that want to come out, be entertained, have a good time, feel value for their money and drink some beer, right? Essentially. Yeah. And, but it's, it's actually shifted. Like my, I thought my target market was like 18 to 22, come to my event, get really drunk. Um, but it shifted. We got a lot of families coming to our events. That's cool. Yeah. But we we are in the entertainment business that a lot of people maybe haven't seen the rodeo world. We're not in the rodeo business. We're in the entertainment business. We have to entertain people. Yeah, and that's like a lot of people make fun of me for the the random shit that I do out there. But I'm like... It's entertainment. Well, you're not the paying customer. So if the paying customer is happy with it, why not? They're coming back to my events. Yeah. Um, One other piece of uh, rodeo memorabilia out there is the famous Teepee Creek Terror of... What is it? Teepee Creek Terror Totter? I call it the Toro Totter. So... You have that one now, right? The one that used to be in Teepee Creek. Yeah. Yeah. So the the biggest draw around my events is I, because I have the fighting bulls, is try and create different events where I can utilize my animals, give the crowd something, entertainment to watch. And uh, yeah, so one of them is the, the Toro Totter. I've actually kind of explained my events to somebody. Like it's like kind of a combination of like Jackass and Nitro Circus with a bullfight. Like, it's kind of... It's the jackass circus. Yeah, exactly. It's the element zone, baby. Because you've <laughs> done, you've done like, Ring of Fears. Have you done the inflatable ball soccer one? Yeah, and the worst, so the worst part about all this stuff is just because, like, liability scares shit out of me. 
So I always have to be the first person that tries everything, just see how sketchy oh, it really no. is. What's your insurance you people insurance. think when you come in with another idea? Um, yeah, we uh, have a love-hate relationship. <laughs> Mostly hate. <laughs> insurance is expensive. So what can uh, so next weekend uh, will be the Mustachio Bobascio. Two weeks, right? The 20... 24th, 25th. 24th, yeah. 25th, 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 25th yeah. So May, yeah. sorry, coming up Friday, after this Friday, Saturday, weekend. right? What can people expect uh, when they come out Friday and Saturday night? So I'm having a hard time marketing it just because it's so different from everything else in the rodeo industry. But ultimately, I've been explaining it as it is a rodeo. It's probably the closest thing to put it, but it's not quite. Like It's like a combination. So when you go to a regular rodeo, all of the shit you see at the entertainment, like in the intermission, is basically we take all of the intermission acts and create one event with it. And so, like, a lot of people are like, this is way better than a rodeo because it's all them random little things. So, we do a lot of ranch bronc riding. Um, we got, like, sheep riding, ladies cow riding, uh, freestyle bullfighting, bull poker, ring of fear, um, all sorts of just, like, it's it's not traditional. And it probably shouldn't work, but it seems to be really drawn in the crowd and then so that's on the friday and then the saturday is like a brc bull riding um with a live band after so you get your fill of both so they're they're two different nights which is nice because people can come out both nights and see something different yeah exactly and like so i've been trying to market it this way and we the friday night is like kind of more kids orientated more family orientated and then the Saturday night is like where you can go let loose as a parent. So like if you're, if you have kids, come to the Friday. And I mean, kids are welcome both days, but it's geared more towards the kids on the Friday and more towards the adults on the Saturday. I like it. And then what about the other events the rest of the season? You got a couple more. Like so later every on the year. event I try and because just the way my brain is wired is every event is different. So the first one is just kind of low budget, just kind of get our feet underneath us. Um, we had it a couple weeks ago called the Spring Fling, um, just kind of whatever. And then this this one's the bull riding. Um, in July, we have a ranch rodeo. Uh, August, we added a new event this year. Um, I called it the Rank Mini Pony Reunion, uh, but I'm going to have to change marketing on that because everybody's confused. We are not – we'll buck a ca- couple of ponies, but it's more for the kids that are – outgrew the pony deal so it'll be like a, a, a rough stock event um featuring the rank mini pony kids and then in uh they, they all grown up yeah <laughs> they done grown up and then in september is my favorite event and this is a 100 percent my creation i call it dodgeball and that's where i try and do as many events as i can find contestants for where basically a bull chases them so, and then we th- we fill the in-, in between with like bronc riding and stuff, like ranch bronc riding, just so it's not, you know, people got to get up and lick their wounds a little bit. Outstanding. Um, I got to go back to the counselor thing. You you mentioned the counselor, having a counselor. Did you have them before? Uh, so I didn't. You didn't? Um, no. And probably because, you know, we're in our 30s, man. We don't. We don't look after our mental health like we like if it's a lot easier when you break a leg. It's like, okay, I physically broke my leg. Go to the doctor, get it fixed. But when you're struggling in your head, like the the stigma is shifting a little bit now. It's still not great, but like it should be the same kind of concept. You're broken. So go to a doctor or whatever. Counselors are probably the easiest solution to it. Um I ended up actually having to go to like four counselors before I finally found one that I meshed with. Mm -hmm. Um, This guy I deal with right now, he's actually out of Manitoba, and we just do Zoom. Oh, really? Yeah. That works, though. Yeah, it it worked out really slick because my internet connection sucks at my house, so (laughs) I used to go to rodeos, and every time i get a hotel room, i be like, hey, this would be a perfect time for a counseling appointment. Log on to that free Wi-Fi. Yeah, eh? the Saturday morning, (laughs) the free Wi-Fi after continental breakfast, just hammer out a counseling appointment. Hmm. Dustin, have you ever seen one? Do you know what? Uh, full disclosure, never had been in an appointment with a counselor um, until last week. Really? Last week? Yep. No way. Yeah. What'd you guys... First first time ever. Okay. 
I wanted to ask this question though because of all the shit you've seen in the firefighter world and the like the mental stress that I think has that has put on you. And and more specifically like having roomed with you and <laughs> seen the fucking night terrors and like waking up and freaking out like I feel like there's some shit there that probably you just needs to be talked about. Oh, I don't yeah. know if you guys got to that, but Yeah, I'm like the, probably the king of like masking stuff. Um I'm like Travis. I've like always been so busy where I'm just like if I'm busy you don't think about things. Um I said this today on the golf course. I was saying to Ted earlier, I'm like, man, I f- I feel like I'm in the best place I've been uh since making the the move to Calgary and doing less. Just because, like, like I was saying yesterday, I walked around Calgary for four hours or five hours by myself. Just cruising around. Just walking around, like, on the river and taking things in. And, like, sometimes I feel like I need to, I'll be better if I slow down a little bit, if that makes sense, even though, like, I crave being busy and doing stuff. So, yeah, um, yeah, on that side of it, I've probably been the worst at, like, talking about people like Travis, you know, looking after themselves and everybody's doing this, but I've probably been, like, a bit... Uh, a bit uh it's like uncomfortable putting it aside for like myself. It's, yeah it's yeah. like it's hard to admit you're broken and now like it's kind of hard for me to date now because i just like a bag of red flags at this point in time in my life but i'm just honest with everybody like i come with baggage and if you don't like it tough shit but, find somebody else but that honesty will help you because i'm finding now that like years into relationship that stuff catches up to you and all of a sudden, you're not the same person you were at the start or as good as a person as you should be. And like, I'd, and that's where I'm at where I'm at. Yeah, I'd, I'd explain it similar to, like, hockey. Like, where you're, you know, playing defense right now. Like, instead of, you know, you should be on the offense. And if you're not looking after your mental health, like, how are you getting, like, yeah, when the when the puck's in your corner, you're like, let a goal slip by Can't score if you don't have yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. thought when you said offense, defense, you're going to talk about Tinder. You got to go on the offense on Oh, I, okay, fun fact. I'm actually blocked from He's Tinder. He's blocked. That's a oh, fact. Yeah, oh. and it's over oh. something really stupid. Really? So I was hustling right off the bat to have my events, and so I'm like- Oh, you had an event thing on Tinder. Yeah, so I <laughs> was just like trying to figure out how to get different people to come to my events, and so I was like, man, Tinder is a great way to get all of this group of girls- to come to my events. So I took down all of my pictures and I put up posters and like of your events. Of my events. <laughs> this and is a marker. <laughs> this is a marker. Yeah. So it goes against their community standards though, and they banned me for life. For life. Yeah. Oh, and you gotta and, get a fake Facebook account. And I tried Bumble one. too, but Tinder and Bumble are owned by the same company. Oh no. <laughs> Yeah. Just just get a new just make a a burner Facebook yeah. just for Tinder. Facebook dating is where it's at. Oh, okay. All does right. does all Facebook right. have a dating app? Yeah, apparently, apparently. Apparently. That's what he's saying. I'm like right over a hundred on dates though. Well actually yeah. one for a hundred, maybe on dates. Hey, I seen you fly to Toronto for a date once. Holy smokes. Yeah, I, I go all <laughs> in. How'd that go? They make fun of me at work because they're like, Man, you got trap lines everywhere. <laughs> I'm like, well, I live in Edson. <laughs> yeah, I live in Edson. Edson. That's what we do up here. Yeah, I just like I keep drawing a radius around, and I just like have had no luck in this area. Maybe I'll go elsewhere. Who knows? I think that next what? route is maybe an import, <laughs> 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 mail order bride. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear! I found one one time for like twenty five hundred bucks, and I'm like, this for sure is a scam. Oh my! Like God. I'm not sending twenty five hundred bucks. I was gonna say, was it the best money you ever spent or worse? <laughs> no. Holy How do you feel about working at the Element Zone? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Um. Oh no. So so serious. I think that doing what you're doing in the community is probably probably something that could be helpful. And it's you probably like, meet the right people. In it's that super super space. therapeutical too, because it's like, so I can just go out there have an event. Like I do quite a bit athletically. Like I'll just jump a bull just for the hell of it. And it's cool to see people see me at my high. And, like, my goal with it all is is if everybody can hear my story and then see me at my high, like, man, if this guy can go through all of that and to get to here, like, sure, I can probably get through what I'm getting through because it's nothing compared to that. That's pretty cool to think when you think that way because everybody around there would know your story and know what happened and then be able to come out to your event and go, man, this guy built this. There's 800 people here. He just jumped a bull <laughs> and we're having a great time and this is great for the community and like yeah, it's a pretty like, cool full circle moment if you're someone that said, Man, that's the guy that, you know, this happened to and yeah. now look at him. 
Because some people don't go, don't get that option. No, and the, and like, your legacy is going to be much different. So the, the the one quote that I've seen is, um, and it resonates with me like to this day. It's like trying to make an impact while trying to earn a living. And like I think about that all the time. Like I have Who to. Who said that? I seen it on Facebook one day. Oh, okay. Maybe Pinterest. I don't know. I like that. George Washington said it. Yeah, but like that's like. I need to make money off my events, otherwise, like my power bill, they get a little mad when uh, there's no money on it. So I gotta be transparent to make money, but I also don't want to make millions. I just want to make enough to pay for everything, and then if there's a little bit left over, we put it back into the community. I like it. What else we gotta cover, Dustin? The definition. Yeah, that's trying to think of what that's, else. That's the last thing. I mean. Travis, you have a crazy story from from the start to the finish, and I think we hit on everything. We talked about your freestyle bullfighting, putting on events, the element zone. Um, yeah. Did we miss anything? I don't know, other than, you know, I just, if you're struggling, like there's way more people out there that are willing to help you. Um, case in point with my element zone that even I realized, like there's people texting me constantly, like, hey, man, where can I help? But you got to be willing to accept their help. And, like, I was always just bad for just, oh, I can do this myself. Well, you can until you can't. And, like, I, you know, I, I appreciate you for actually going to a counselor or whatever. And I kind of look at it now like it's getting your oil changed in your car. Like, if you don't keep up the maintenance, like, I go now and I was telling somebody this recently. And they're like, well, you go to a counselor because you are got all this shit. I'm like, man, I'm going to a counselor right now for a point in my life where, like, actually, you're probably worse off than I am right now, <laughs> if we're being honest. But I'm just, you know, more aware of what's going on. And I'm I'm more aware now, like, I strategically book my counseling appointments around, like, holidays. Because, like, my mom's birthday is on Christmas Day. So, like, some days are just straight up heavy. Mm-hmm. And so I'll or try. Like today. Yeah, like Mother's Day today. I'll do things like I will dodge and deflect. I'll drive all the way down to Calgary to talk to you guys <laughs> so that I can dodge, you know. Mother's Day at home. Yeah, exactly. Just stuff like that. Thanks for being here, though. It's not the best way sometimes. Like, sometimes I get myself in a little bit of a pickle, like, financially, because, like I said, we have to make money. Otherwise, our bills don't pay themselves. But that's how I deal with it. And it's not – like, I went garage sailing today. So <laughs> it's not uh, – it, like, the – Everybody deals with shit differently. And, like, that's how I cope with stuff. And if you guys make fun of me or whatever, tough shit. Did you get any I'm good not deals? I'm fun of you. You got a sweet <laughs> bullfighter statue. Yeah, that I dropped. I spent 40 bucks on it. I dropped it and broke Already it. broke the head <laughs> off. <So that's laughs> super glue? Sweet. Can you super glue back? Maybe. I'm going to try. Uh, I'm, I see a counselor. And, and Brett and I have talked about it, Brett Gardner, about it being maintenance. Yeah, exactly. Or preventative that's maintenance. That's what you said. Like it's yeah. maintenance, or, or mm-hmm. it's like working on skills, and it's it's keeping things away from. He has a way of explaining it better, where it's keeping things away from crisis, like so we don't get yeah. to you crisis don't get to mode. Crisis so mode, Brett yeah. Monnier's wife actually said this, and it Maybe, resonated. Yeah. She's just like, if you keep shelving all of those thoughts, eventually that shelf's going to get too heavy and it's going to break. So if you don't properly deal with it, you're gonna it'd be like the straw that broke the camel's back. In my sense, it was COVID. And, you know, I I hate to say that because then all you get all the government conspiracy theories. No, no. And it's just like, no, it wasn't it wasn't actually COVID. It was just that time frame where I slowed down enough to think about everything. Because you could have, you could have, had you been seeing somebody and dealing with all that when COVID hit, you could have been in a, in a place to get through COVID just fine. Yeah, exactly. If you would have had the tools and the... Yeah. Like I, at that point in time, I went in the tool chest to figure out what tool was required to fix this, and I didn't have no tools in the toolbox. So now I have, like... Reiki? Re- yeah, Reiki. <laughs> one one and done. It wasn't. It didn't work. You have your grab yeah. sale? But, like, so, for instances, <laughs> like, like you were there, I took bulls to the CFR, and it did not go well. It was, like, worst-case scenario. Oh, yeah, that was really bad. Yeah, so now I'm in a point in time in my life where I can have an absolute disaster but I know how to properly deal with these things. Yeah. Because had that happened prior, it would have been a different story, yeah, right? Yeah, that might have been the camel or the straw that broke the camel's back. So, yeah, like just look after yourself and that's all I have to say, basically. That's all I got to say about that. Fair. 
Defi- what? Definition? Definition time. I don't know what else. Web- so, like website tickets? We, we should probably oh, yeah, Element Zone. That. Where can we find out everything there is find to Find us know. on Facebook. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, Element Zone 13, uh, Snapchat. Um, I'll Tinder. Probably, probably send you a picture of my small wiener. And by that, I mean dog. I've got a wiener dog. His name's Waldo. Yeah, his name's Waldo. But uh, yeah, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and because there's uh, a fa- there's a there's pages for Mustachio, Bobachio, and Element Zone on there, right? Yeah, yeah. I try and do most of it through Element Zone 13, but um, yeah, that's the big one. And head out, head out to uh, head out to Edson on the twenty. Fourth and fifth. Fourth and fifth. Fourth and fifth. Yeah, and then I got a website where you can purchase advanced tickets. They're a little bit cheaper. Uh, Elementzone.ca. That's kind of all you need to know, I guess. Let's, One more question. Let's get the That's definition. It. Travis James, what is your definition of cowboy shit? Oof, my definition of cowboy shit. Um, I would say probably tough, maybe. And I would just, if you're tough enough to admit that you're struggling, like that takes some cowboy shit to do that. I like it. Thanks for doing this, Travis. Thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Once uh, again, elementzone.ca. Yeah, go to the events. And, and participate in the events Facebook if you pages. want. Yeah. If people want to come and like, do this bull, stuff, they can mess, they have message you, right? He has an event yeah, called so Dodge like, Bull. Bull poker and ring of fear, you just got to show up. No And sign fees. the waiver. Oh, and sign the waiver, yeah. <laughs> my uh, my two ladies that helped me are very, very adamant on that part. Yeah, here's the waiver. I need your signature. Because right off the bat, we were having like 30 people doing that with no waivers or nothing. Ooh, yeah, that's a little bit scary. <laughs> like it was Western. <laughs> well, I'll have to admit, Trav, uh, it's, it's been great to see you bounce back from a really tough period of time and tough things in your life and seeing the Element Zone kicking ass and you kicking ass and, and seeing you be able to w- walk away from bullfighting and still keep kicking ass and, and going on to new things and production. And it's pretty cool to see. So i uh, been proud to watch you keep on rocking and rolling. Yeah, I uh, appreciate you being a part of the journey right from the get-go. And hopefully one of these years I can build up enough uh, spectators that I can afford to hire you at one of these events. <laughs> 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 no knock against Dom. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry Dom. Dom. Yeah, Sorry, Dom. But, uh, but if Dustin uh, can't make one, he'll probably just send a ghost emoji. Yeah. Just yeah, like, the sorry. ghost emoji. Can't do it. Yeah. Maybe the clown emoji. Yeah. We're going to talk about that. What about the clown emoji? Well, I want to. I always said in my life, I want to clown an event. Oh, yeah. And I think the Are we going to put zone, this on record right now? The element for the zone public to hear? Mustachio Bulbashio might be Dustin's clowning the event debut. in the future that I get my clowning appearance at. Do it. Oh, man. Okay, I tried you to hear first, folks. D- uh, folks, Dustin might clown an event. May clown an event. For Travis. But I'll uh, but I'm not I'm gonna do it incognito under a secret name. Dusty Trails. <laughs> Ted the Clown. <laughs> okay, let's let's All wrap right. it up. Lots of fun. Thanks, Trav. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, thanks to Travis James. He's right here once again. Appreciate you doing the show. Uh jump back on the mic if you want for any any further comments or uh, any heckling. You're welcome to uh, bust our balls a little bit in the post-show portion here. Yeah, I don't know if I have a uh, great podcast, you guys. Hopefully, um, it you know somebody gets some sort of value out of it. And uh, if not, just keep looking after yourself, I guess. That's the best thing I could say. Perfect. Are you cheering for the Oilers, Trav? Are you an Oilers fan? I actually don't like hockey. Oh, I, that's, that's allowed. Did you play? I tried to play, and uh, I... Are we s- deflecting again? Yeah, we Is are. But deflecting? Quick th- quick story. I tried to sign up for hockey when I was little, and I would have been the worst kid on the worst team, and I'm too competitive for that. Mm. So, mm. But you like basketball. Yeah, I'm a huge basketball fan yeah, right now. Really? The Knicks um, and who is playing this afternoon? The Nuggets are playing, the Timberwolves. Hell of a and series. The, is that the West Final? Uh, I don't follow that closely, but... Oh, okay. You know, hey, he knew who the two teams were playing. You got I, flew to Tor- I flew to Toronto for a basketball game. When? Uh, two years ago. We, oh, cool. I mentioned that in the pod. It was kind of a date. You went on a date? Was, well, to oh, you, a date? I didn't know I was going to a basketball game. Too. Yeah, oh. I wasn't sure if she was going to actually show up or not, so I made sure there was a basketball game involved. And that she wasn't a 60-year-old man? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you didn't get catfished by a dude? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Have you ever been catfished? Um, I've been catfished, and I'm pretty sure I've done the catfishing. <laughs> With <laughs> the mustachio <laughs> bobachio posters. Oh. Yeah. That's funny. So Do you, you just got, tell them all to meet at the bull, at the bull riding? At the venue? Yeah, I 
try and get some extra help at my events. Yep. Uh, how bad was your, your catfishing? Was it like just a different, totally different person, or or were the, were or the, was was it a the man? Were the pictures only from the from the neck up? Uh, s- oh, she might even be listening to this podcast, but oh, she doesn't know who she is. Uh-oh. Okay, I opened the door and she was a lot shorter than I was expecting, and. Like, are we talking, like... A lot more compact, maybe. Like, if she was taller and things were stretched out just a little bit more, it would have been better, but (laughs) it, uh... But you got catfish. I stuck around, had a hell of a supper, and, uh... But she didn't have balls, so that was probably... (laughs) That was probably a win. Yeah, no balls, but, uh... (laughs) Jeez. Yeah, not what I was expecting. They made fun of me at work the next morning when I showed up with a Tupperware container, though, for leftovers. (laughs) She gave you leftovers? (laughs) Yeah, that's awfully nice. That's woman. That's awfully nice. That's uh, I don't know where jeez, <laughs> I don't know where this is going. <laughs> oh man, what a finale! What was what was your worst catfish experience, Dustin? Me? Did you have any? I don't know if I ever had any real, real bad ones. No, I never really had any like really really bad. Oh really? First dates or catfish? I didn't go on like blind dates or oh. or anything like that. I had one where I had to bail out. I was just like, well, I got I, I got I catfish, had... and I was like, um. I think I had something come up. I got to go. I had one like that, too. I texted Mike and said, hey, man, can you call me and pretend this is important? <laughs> so he called me. Hey, my truck's broke down. And I was like, oh, yeah, sorry. I'll take you home. Then I'll go pick up Mike. <laughs> oh, jeez. I just had to get out. I was like, this is. Yeah. I I've think that the dating hoodwinked. world has changed so much now with social media. As much as it's like, like, I know the person isn't who they are on social media, but like, you can't really escape yourself. Any, like, Unless you don't have social. Yeah, I guess. That's a big commitment, though. For I've tried dating chicks it. with no social media, and it was still a bust. <laughs> <laughs> Did you meet them in real life? That's probably though? the one I catfished. <laughs> <laughs> Did you uh, think that you think your mustache was bigger than it really was, or what happened? Ah, uh, probably something else was bigger than she was expecting. <laughs> 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 your wiener dog. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh dear. All right. Uh, what else we got, Dustin? Anything I, else? I think this has been a great show. Yeah. Thanks to Sean Morton, our editor. Yep. Friend of the show, friend of Trav. Thanks to Storm Defoe. Thank you, Storm. Love you, Storm. Thank you to everybody. Storm did all the video today from the backyard pot. She had to put her jacket on because it got cold. Yeah, cool off. Thank you for listening. Yeah. And, uh, and thank you for being our friends. Yeah. Thank you for being a friend. Um, what do we else got coming up next, Ted? Oh, yeah. Uh, what day is it today? Today's May 12th, so the show will be out on the 15th. And then, uh, then it's like long weekend we're at home and then... Then it's full on event mode. Then yep. we'll see you in July, basically. Yep. But yeah, yeah, Brandon Manitoba PBR Cup Series. I gotta go do a shoe meeting on the twenty fourth of May on Friday in Winnipeg. So I'm gonna fly out there. We got Nolene show coming up. Nolene Hoffman yep. on Canadian tour with Charlie yep. Crockett. Uh, May twenty third at the Gray Eagle here in Calgary. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. Yeah, that'll be good. We gotta we gotta make our signs, Dustin. Yeah, our glitter signs. We'll have those ready for the for the show. And then as soon as she's off the stage, I gotta bail to the airport because I fly out at nine thirty. So I don't oh, get yeah. to see Charlie Crockett. I'll, we, I'll watch bail. Charlie for for you. Yeah, send me some yeah. videos after. Should be good. Um, then yeah, Brandon. Then I go to uh, GP with Matt and Cole. Um, there'll be two Cole Robertsons in GP because, uh, Cowboy, Cowboy Cole, Cole and our Cole Robertson, Curtis's son is working the events with us too. So, uh, I was texting Dan Boris the other day about a rooming list and I was like, yeah, I need one for uh, Matt Schneider, um, uh, uh, Cole Robertson and myself. And he's like, no, I already got a, Cole's on a separate contract. I already got a room for Cole. I don't need it. I don't need, uh, you don't need two a, Cole Robertson. and I was like, no, there's two of the, this is, this is our Cole Robertson. Then there's Cowboy and Cowboy is spelled with an I. So, anyways, we do that, and then uh, then I got to go to London. Uh, get to go to London, Ontario, for the that same weekend. Then uh, I'm gonna stay out there for Kingston for two days in Ottawa. Then fly back in time to finish up Rocky on Sunday with uh, Cole and Matt, uh, the 50th Rocky Pro Rodeo. So I'll finish that up, and then uh, hopefully be home for a little while for like a week. Then we go to Wainwright, Pinoka, Bull Boston, uh, Clooney, Lions, Charity, PBR, June 28th, I think. It's a and big, then busy stampede. Busy season begins. Yeah, and you got Leduc. Yeah, we'll go to Leduc Rodeo. Galician Bronc match. Brooks Rodeo. Brooks Pro, Pro Rodeo. Rodeo. For Bassano Pro Rodeo. Back at Airdrie Pro Rodeo mm-hmm. end of June. Um, yeah, then we'll you do some stuff in Calgary, Calgary. And then uh, out to Morris and Manhattan. Yeah. Bruce. Bruce. The Bruce Stampede. Busy run. So. And then what do you got in August? Uh, we go to Toefield for Curtis Newfeld's PBR. Uh, we got 
Pincher Creek, Lethbridge. Yeah. Yeah, this will be, be, be a busy summer. A wedding or two. What do you got, Travis? Maybe he'll come for uh, my event in September. Hey. Maybe, maybe he'll get invited. Need a clown? <laughs> awesome. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. See you next time. See ya.